Hey everybody, what's cracking? This episode of the Joe Rogan Experience Podcast is brought to you by Stamps.com. Stamps.com is a very convenient way to eliminate going to the post office and doing everything from your office. With Stamps.com, you can print up official U.S. postage on your home computer with a regular printer. It's a beautiful thing. You print it, you weigh it, they give you a digital scale, you weigh your packages, the mailman comes, you give them the packages with the stuff printed on it, and you're done. You don't have to do that waiting in line shit. You don't have to talk to someone who doesn't really want to talk to you. You don't have to get them to weigh off all your packages. If you have a home business, if you send things regularly online, this is a huge lifesaver. Um, Tom Segura and Christina Pazitsky, they use Stamps.com to send all of their podcast stuff, like their t-shirts and shit. Uh, Brian Redband uses it for all the Death Squad kitty cat t-shirts that he sends out. Those are all done through Stamps.com. You'll never have to go to the post office again. We've been using Stamps.com for a long time, and we have zero complaints. It is truly an awesome service. And if you use my promo code JRE, you get a special no-risk trial plus a $110 bonus offer, including a digital scale and up to $55 of free postage. So go to Stamps.com, and before you do anything else, click on the microphone on the top of the homepage and type in J-R-E. That's Stamps.com J-R-E. It will make your life oh so much more convenient. Go there and enjoy. We're also brought to you by 1-800-Flowers.com. And I apologize to 1-800-Flowers.com because I'm half a moron. And uh, I guess I said everything right in the first half of the commercial. And then the second half, I said stamps.com. Listen, folks, a lot of times I have a lot of shit on my mind. There's a lot of different things going on. And we were doing a podcast with Justin Martindale. And I was just trying to fight off all the gay thoughts bouncing off the inside of my skull. So my apologies. But 1-800-Flowers.com is another awesome podcast sponsor that we enjoy very much because uh, it's, it makes it so that you don't have to go to the flower arrangement store. What do they call them? Florist? You don't want to be caught dead in a florist because if you get caught in a florist, it means you lost. It means you're there with a bunch of other saps. Don't do it. Do it online and you can be incognito. You can keep all your manly street cred, but yet get all the love from your woman and make her feel happy. 1-800, and maybe you're a man. I mean, maybe you're one of those dudes who just like sending flowers to your buddies. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Look, you know, it's not a fucked up thing, right? You could send your buddy a six-pack of beer and no one says anything. You could send him some cigars. No one has a problem with it. You could send your buddy some beef jerky. No one will say a thing. But send your friend, one of your best guy friends, your heterosexual guy friends, some beautiful creations of Mother Nature, and you will be looked at as some sort of a weirdo. I don't get it. There's weird w- rules in this world. Why is pink a-, a-, a silly color for men to wear? Why is it, why is it a-, a questionable color? It makes no sense. It's a goddamn color. All right? We're crazy. Something's wrong with people. But there's nothing wrong with flowers. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com today. And because Valentine's Day is just around the corner. The corner? The corner? I said the corner. Because Valentine's Day. I have grass-fed butter in my mouth, folks. Drinking this bulletproof coffee. He's got me all. <coughs> there we go. 1-800-Flowers.com. Because Valentine's Day is almost here, now's your time to order roses for Valentine's. And with this special limited time offer just for my listeners, available only until Sunday, February 9th at midnight, you can order 18 beautiful red roses for just twenty nine ninety nine. That's $25 off the regular price. You really can't beat that deal. 18 roses for just $29.99, and nothing says romance better than red roses. That's why it's weird if you send one to your buddy. But it's okay to do, man. If your buddy has a problem with you sending him roses, that guy's an asshole, and you need to get better friends. Anyway, this offer, 1-800-Flowers.com. Remember, it ends February 9th. Flowers.com is a fantastic service. It makes it super easy and convenient to send nature's masterpieces to your loved ones. So 1-800-Flowers.com, and remember, it ends Sunday, February 9th at midnight, 18 red roses for just $29.99. Do not wait. Wow her for Valentine's Day. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com from your desktop or mobile device. Click on the radio microphone in the upper right-hand corner and enter in J-R-E. That's 1-800-Flowers.com and enter J-R-E. 
JRE. Or call 1 800 Flowers and mention JRE. We're also brought to you by Onnit.com. That's O N N I T. Now, manly men like Cameron Haynes do a lot of lifting weights and they need some supplements. They need some protein in their diet, they need to eat healthy foods. And they need strength and fitness equipment, strength and conditioning equipment like the stuff that we sell at Onnit.com. We're going to have to hook up Cameron Haynes with a zombie kettlebell. When he's out there shooting elk with his bow, you got to prepare for the apocalypse because shit could go down. If you've never seen uh, the zombie kettlebells at Onnit.com, they're essentially just like normal kettlebells. But we had an artist named Steven Shubin Jr. If you look up the big screen, you can see those. Um, design these cool faces. They're also 3D mapped and balanced, so they work just like a regular kettlebell. They're not just beautiful, they're actual functional, actually functional. We have the zombie kettlebells, we have chimpanzee kettlebells, the primal kettlebells, which are uh, all the great apes. We have chimpanzees, um, orangutans, chimps, and we even have a uh, gorilla and a howler monkey. The gorilla is my favorite, though, because like my friend Cameron Haynes, I'm an extremist, and uh, I feel like if 70 pounds is the biggest one we, we sell, that's the one I'm working out with, bitch, okay? Because I'm a manly man. That's what I do, all right? We have, we have all kinds of shit that benefits you at Onnit.com. What we call Onnit.com is a human optimization website. So whatever we find that works great and it's good for your health, we sell it. Even soap, we have defense soap that we sell, which is a lot of people, um, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to antibacterial soap. Antibacterial soap is, is kind of sketchy. Like if you use it and you're in a hospital and you're about to perform surgery, that's one thing. But if you use that stuff on your body, the problem is that your body has natural flora. There's natural bacteria on your body that you actually want to preserve. That's why it's good to eat probiotics. Things like acidophilus actually promote healthy bacteria both in your gut and in your skin. And defense soap is uh, another way to do that. Defense soap is... Uh, uh, my friend Guy, who owns the company, created this because he is a, a grappler and he has been involved in wrestling his whole life. And when you have uh, a lot of jujitsu guys or wrestling guys or MMA guys, they, they, they get a lot of skin rashes, whether it's um, skin conditions, whether it's staph infection or whether it's uh, sometimes we get, I've gotten ringworm from jujitsu. You can get a lot of this um, mat herpes, really, ew. And a lot of that is, uh, can be prevented from hygiene. And that harsh antibacterial soap actually can make it you more susceptible to these things because it, it actually kills the good bacteria as well as the bad bacteria. But with defense soap, what he's figured out is to use tea tree oil and eucalyptus and all natural ingredients that promote healthy bacteria and, and kill the bad bacteria. It's really good stuff, and it smells good, and it's, it's, it's a healthy, natural soap for your body. Just one more thing that we sell at Onnit.com. Just like the hemp protein powder, which, by the way, will not – have to answer this, I don't know how many times, but will not make you test positive at work. Okay, if you work for UPS and you're worried about pissing hot, you don't have to worry about it. Hemp is actually not psychoactive. And – the recent farm bill that just got passed, it looks like we're going to be able to grow hemp in, in America, finally. We've been selling hemp at Onnit.com for the longest time, but we've had to buy it from Canada, which is so crazy. That means that American farmers have not been able to make a, grow a crop that's a natural plant, it's not psychoactive, it's not a drug, but because it's related to a drug, it's been illegal. Finally, people are realizing how absolutely ridiculous that is because... We've been able to sell it, but we have to buy it from Canada. So it's great for my friends up in Canada that are farmers. It's great for the Canadian farmers, but it is absolutely ridiculous that American farmers are not able to grow hemp. Finally, we're going to start being able to do that. They're, I guess it's going to start at universities and in places where it's legal statewide. And then uh, I'm sure that this wave seems to be spreading and it's going to eventually go through the entire country because there's no reason to stop it. It's not a drug. We're not talking even about marijuana, which of course I think should be legal anyway. But what this is, is just the hemp. And it makes a fine protein powder. One of the very best protein powders, very easily digestible, has amino, all the amino acids in it. It's, it's got healthy fats in it. 
and we sell it at onnit.com, as, lo- as well as Hemp Force Bars, which are uh, hemp protein in bar form, which is great. When you're out there hiking in the mountains, Cameron Haynes, and you need some snacks, we'll give you some Hemp Force Bars to keep in your backpack so you stay healthy. Use the Sounds code good. word ROGAN and save 10% off any and all supplements. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com. Aubrey Marcus will be here uh, tomorrow, actually. We're going to do a podcast with Aubrey, and we're going to talk about all the latest developments that are on it. But until then, today, we have Cameron Hayes, master, bow hunter, all-around badass. Cue the music. Whenever you're ready, Jamie. Maybe. Uh, it's, you forgot the volume, you fuck. You fucked it up. At least it's not live. Oh, the computer did it. At least it's not live, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know how to do it, or are we done? Nope, it's coming. Show's over. Yeah. All day! (laughs) It wouldn't be the same if everything came out smooth. Well, Cameron, first of all, thanks for doing this podcast. For people who don't know Cameron... Cameron Haynes is a, a, a famous bow hunter, which is a, a rare thing. It's very rare that someone becomes famous as, as a bow hunter. And in the most manly form of bow hunting ever, you're famous for shooting the biggest, most majestic North American animals with sticks. That's right. I mean, that's what you're famous for. You're famous for taking out giant bugling elk with a flying stick. <laughs> That's pretty badass, dude. I, I wouldn't say famous. Let's. You're famous to me. You're famous. Uh, I I told a friend of mine who's a, a, a hunting fan. He's a, a personal trainer, and I said I'm doing this podcast with Cameron Ains. He goes, Oh, that's that keep hammering guy. That's it. Keep so, hammering. dude, like, <laughs> okay, one other guy, you and one other guy. <laughs> you okay. are famous amongst Jared hunters. Knows me. Yeah. So there's three. I brought you up to my friend Ryan Callahan, who uh, works at First Light, and he said, Oh yeah, I know who that guy is. Yeah. So people know who you are, man. Okay. You have become at least. Uh, can I say you have notoriety? Okay, that, yeah, I'd say that. Okay. So notoriety from uh, killing elk with uh, with flying sticks. That's it, yeah. How does one go uh, about becoming famous or at least develop internet notoriety from killing elk with flying sticks? Um, you know, I think for me, it's just, I don't know, I just came up just like everybody else. So it's like, so what I've done kind of gives other people that didn't have any breaks or just regular guys hope to chase their dreams. I mm-hmm. really think that's it. I think that's why people like me. Well, I'll tell you how I found out about you. Um, I, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube, on online, whether it's uh, whether videos about anything that I find interesting. And I saw this video of this guy carrying rocks in his backpack going up hills training for elk hunting. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? what is that? And then I thought about it. I was like, that actually is a pretty smart move. Like, I've never heard of anybody training for hunting. Mm-hmm. I went hunting when I shot that mule deer with Steve Ranella. Um, that was the, uh, the first time I ever went hunting. And I was amazed at how tired I was. Yeah. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, I thought I was in really good shape. Mm-hmm. But when you're climbing up those muddy hills and the, the Missouri breaks and everything's like sloshing and it's, you know, these steep hills and, you know, you're doing it for six hours in a row, like, Man, you get exhausted. Yeah. Your legs get rubber. Your lungs are burning. I was like, I can't believe this. I was thinking, I need to work out for hunting. Yeah. But I never heard of anybody doing that before until I saw you. Right. Well, it, it you know, like elk hunting, you can get up at sometimes five in the morning to get to where maybe you put some elk to bed the night before and walk. So an hour before daylight, then you're hunting all day, and then you get back to camp after dark, maybe at eight or nine o'clock. That's a long day. And that's, it's a long day. People aren't used to doing that i mean how often do you work out for 15 hours a day not only that like you if you shoot an elk then you have to take that elk back and you have to figure out how to carry it through Mm -hmm. the mountains like that's where it gets really crazy because like what's the biggest elk you've ever shot um it's probably a a roosevelt bull i killed in oregon in 2010 and we're figuring it weighed about 1200 pounds is 12 or 13 God, years old. That's a big animal. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. Woo! How long did it take you to carry 1,200? I mean, on that's on the bone. So mm-hmm. once you quarter it and skin it and take the head off of it and the antlers, how much is it, how much are you carrying out? About 500 pounds. You know, we had it quartered up <sighs> and then with the hide because I wanted to get it mounted and the head and all that. So we had to carry about 500 pounds, but I had a few guys with me, so, you know, made it a little easier yeah, I guess. You, you have to bring, like, a pack crew. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, they're big animals, and that's just that's part of it. But that's, you know, when you can go into the mountains where an elk lives every day and, and like you said, with a sharp stick, take it out, harvest it, and then so you're, you're on its home court and then bring it back to your truck and back to your freezer, that's, that's a powerful experience. You know, that's the whole, the whole thing is hard. Everything about it is hard. But to be able to do that, I mean, it's given me confidence to know that in whatever everyday life I can achieve things, you know, because that's about as tough as it gets for me. Yeah, I've always said that adversity is a very important thing for human beings because if you don't go through adversity, you never know that you can. There's always going to be questions, and every time you do go through adversity, it sort of adds on to your ability and your confidence in all walks of life. It's mm-hmm. like this tattoo that I have is uh, Miyamoto Musashi, the guy who wrote the Book of Five Rings. Mm-hmm. And when I was a kid and I was uh, um, competing in martial arts tournaments i i read the book of five rings and i remember this one quote once you understand the way broadly you can see it in all things and once you've gone through the kind of adversity that you must go through to you know hike nine miles into a mountain shoot an elk and then bring that giant beast back and then cook it like that is a a, that is you you will develop confidence and you'll develop a sense of accomplishment that's very difficult to recreate Mm mm-hmm yeah. And that's to do that. I know how difficult that is. And so in training, I try to simulate that as much as possible. You know, I mean, that's where the, the carrying the 130 pound rock up the hill or, you know, for training, I've run a hundred mile ultra marathons, you know, that type of thing. Basically, I just want to, I, I want to simulate that misery because I want to know <clears throat> what being miserable feels like. If you don't ever know, you never know how you're going to react. Some people might fold up, quit, but, uh, so I try to get there and as often as possible. How did you, why why did you decide a rock? Why not like weights? Well, you can measure weights. Did you try to just go with the rock because it's even more primal? (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I just, I had been seeing this rock, you know, I run this mountain all the time. So I've been seeing this rock and uh, I was like, man, I need to get that rock to the top of the hill. And so I did this seminar at Cabela's and uh, I said, hey, anybody who wants to come up, I'm going to go run the mountain because everybody knows I run this mountain. So they came in for the Cabela seminar. And I told him, I said, if you run the mountain, I'll give you a free DVD. Just come hang. I just like to work out with people. Just, you know, I like to see right. people, people sacrificing. So I said, I'm going to carry this rock up and we can all go do it. And I figured, it, it, I mean, the rock, I figured it's about 70 pounds. I had no idea. But <laughs> so I get up there, I have this empty pack and I have everybody there. And I'm like, all right. Just hang on, hang on for a second. I'm just gonna throw this rock on my pack, and I lift. The first time I'd ever touched it, and I was like, "Wow, this is more than 70 pounds." And so, I ended up getting it up to the top, and then we tried to take pictures, trying to. I couldn't even lift that thing over my head because a rock is just weird to to lift. And um, so, I ended up taking it down off the mountain. I'm like, I, "Obviously, it's more than 70. I want to figure out how much it is." So it was 130 pounds, but but. It was just kind of on a whim, I guess, is how that came about. Now I just now it's just my rock. <laughs> Pet now rock. it's your workout rock. It is. Yeah. Now, are you allowed to just pull rocks out of the forest? Is there any regulations about that? I, I may have poached that rock. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's still there. It's I just carried it up and down. I never take it. I I took it to the gym to weigh it, but it's back. It's up on the mountain right now. Oh, okay. So what would you do if you came there and you saw somebody else throw that rock in their backpack? You're like, hey, man. No, what was he going to do? Somebody did, I think they... They, you know, had seen the rock talked about. So, and I said, Hey, you know, people, people kind of quit, you know, people question everything for whatever reason. Sure. And so they say, Oh, that's not 130 pounds. I'm like, okay, well here it is. Go pack it to wherever you want and weigh it. So somebody did move at like 20 yards <laughs> <laughs> and I did notice that. But other than that, it just kind of sits wherever I leave it. That, well, <laughs> if it's heavy enough, that's good that nobody will steal it or m- most people won't steal it. I should say. Nobody's gonna, I don't think they're going to steal it. Now, when you take that rock up to the top of the mountain, how often do you do this? I do it about once a week. Once a week? Yeah. That's kind of, wow. I, I mix it up and that's one, my once a week type, something different. Other than that, I usually just run the mountain. So once a week, once every seven days, you carry that. How far are you carrying it? It's a mile and a half. Jesus. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That hurts my lower back just thinking about it. Yeah, me too. Oh. <laughs> um, is, that, is there any danger of like doing, that's like some serious weight that you're carrying on your back like that. It's an awkward way to carry weight. Yeah. And to do it like once a week. Yeah, I, I try to think I'm bulletproof, but I've found out that I'm not. Mm. And so, yeah. And that's a, yeah, that's the trail right there. So 
up wow. the hill with the rock. That's some serious work. Like the amount of actual physical kinetic work that you have to do to go up a hill with a 130 pound rock on your back like that. Like, mm-hmm. man, that's got to get you in some insane shape. Oh, it, it helps. You know, I mean, it's just every everything helps mixing it up. I do a lot of different things, but that's just one of them. Now, was this something that you had always done? And then when you got into hunting, you just sort of ramped it up? Or did you, did you like really get into fitness once you became a hunter? That's another shirt I have, you know, ramp it up. Oh, really? <laughs> is it really? Yeah, it is. Oh, no, no kidding. But uh, no, let's see. So I started bow hunting. I was um, just a teenager. And uh, it was, I ended up killing a spike bow elk my very first year. I think it was 18 or 19. And uh, that was, you know, to kill a bull with a bow, where I, I came from a real small town. I mean, 20-some kids in my graduating class. And so um, a lot of people hunted, but to kill a bull with a bow was, like, special. And so I got attention for that. I was like, this is some positive reinforcement. And I'm like, you know, this is after high school, after the high school sports and all that, and trying to find my way, trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do. And so... I liked hunting. I liked the challenge of it. I got some positive reinforcement from it. So I'm like, hey, this is pretty cool because I didn't hardly know anybody who'd killed a bull with a bow back then. And so uh, I was successful. But from there, I just wanted more, wanted more of a challenge. And then, you know, I started going into the wilderness, into the Oregon's biggest wilderness, Eagle Cap Wilderness. It's 375,000 acres. And uh, so you can get back in there away from people. And I thought, well, now, I want to go to the middle of this wilderness because that would be even more badass. And if I could kill a bull back there, man, that would be the ultimate. And so it was just kind of from there I realized how the physical part of bow hunting where where it, you know, was more important. And so I just – it was kind of a progression. You know, I've always, always ran 10Ks and different things like that. But I figured, man, you can't be in too good a shape to – to challenge that country. And, uh, so I've just, you know, I've never, I haven't reached my limit and I'm trying to, to try to become what I always say is the ultimate predator. So it, it becomes, uh, a part of like your, your whole psyche. It becomes a part of like what you're doing with your life it mm-hmm. becomes the, the challenge of it becomes almost as important as what you're doing itself. Like you're not just going out and getting an elk for meat you know, which mm-hmm. I'm sure you enjoy elk meat. Yeah. But it's also, it's, 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 it's almost sort of like a spiritual quest. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the most powerful moments I've had have been in the mountains, in the wilderness after um, killing a bull because everything that goes into it, you know, it's not just the fact that I killed an animal. It's, uh, it's how much I respect the animal, how tough the country is, back, all the training. It's just a cu- accumulation of all that work and all that investment of emotion and everything else. And so that's, yeah, it is, it, it's spiritual. I mean, um, by yourself back there is uh, as raw as it gets. It's tough. And eating the animal that you, you've you killed uh, for, f- I just started hunting. I've been only been hunting a little over a year, year and a half. And for me, uh, the most delicious meals, the most satisfying meals I've ever had is venison that, I, that I've killed myself. Mm-hmm. There's something... It's something intimate about it, I guess. It's something you're much more attached to what you're what you're eating. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've never killed anything with a bow, much less a 1,200 pound bull elk with a bow in mm-hmm. the middle of the woods. I mean, that's got to ramp it up another notch. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Because you're shooting something with a rifle. You know, I shot that mule deer from 200 yards away. Yeah. That's pretty far. Yeah. You know, you're shooting these animals 30, 40 yards away from you, mm-hmm. and you're and they're huge. Yeah. No, they're, I mean, they don't commit suicide. They're, <laughs> they are, you know, they're used to lions. They're used to being hunted. Mm-hmm. So to get into bow range, you know, in their red zone, so to speak, you know, that 30 to 40 yards, um, that's difficult. They're dialed in. They're used to being hunted every single day. I mean, they're, they're never turned off. And so, uh, yeah, it's tough. And then you have just basically a sharp stick, you know, one arrow. You've got the arrows laying over there, and it's just, it's amazing how lethal with a razor sharp broadhead an arrow can be. And, uh, I've seen, you know, there's videos of, of bull, huge bulls I've killed dropping in seconds just from that, you know, quicker, even than maybe a, a rifle would kill them. And that's, uh, 
you know, that's pretty amazing. But Th- That is pretty amazing. Well, one of the things about you is uh, because of all your training, because of all this lifting and uh, exercise that you do, you shoot a really heavy bow. You shoot a 90-pound compound bow, mm-hmm. which uh, for folks who don't know, like a lot of people, they'll they'll tell you, like, you don't need to shoot anything more than 60. Mm-hmm. But 90, I've never even heard of anybody shooting a 90. I never even pulled one until I pulled yours. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a ridiculously... I mean that's pretty stout. Yeah. So you're you're sort of like adding to like this whole reason why you're you're exercising and all this fitness and getting, you know, really strong and in in really great shape. You know, you're you're you ha- kind of have to be in great shape just to use the very weapon that you use to take these animals out. Yeah. Well, and it, it's true. You don't you don't necessarily have to shoot 90 pounds. I mean, people do kill. There's women out there bow hunting who are very successful with a 50-pound bow. It's true. You can do it. But, you know, I want to shoot 90. Um, I, what I want on an animal is I want two holes. I want that arrow blowing through so I have two, blood, two holes spilling blood, and that's how I'm going to recover the animal. You know, an arrow kills from hemorrhage, so not from shock like a, like a rifle would. So to get that hemorrhage, whereas a, a 50-pound bow might go in halfway and it might get into the lungs and it might kill it, you know, you might get 12 inches of penetration. If I go clear through that bowl and it's you know maybe 24 inches across well there's a 24 inch wound as opposed to a 12 inch wound and again we're killing by hemorrhage and so it's just going to be that much more lethal in my mind and then if i'm blown through ribs or through a shoulder or it's quartering way hard so i have to go through maybe 30 inches of of mass well i'm i'm going to be able to do that yeah it's not you know it's not necessary so to speak but it's what I'm comfortable with, and I think it makes me that more lethal of a bow hunter. How many other dudes are shooting 90 pounds? I'm not sure. Is there anybody? I don't know. Pro- yeah, I'm sure. Probably one or two? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's there's some. Well, I just pulled it back, and I was thinking, when I was pulling it back, I was like, imagine pulling this thing back if you just climbed up the top of a mountain, and you're absolutely exhausted, mm-hmm. and then you have this one opportunity to see. Have you ever had that happen where you know, you, you're really exhausted to work to get to where the elk is, and then you're, you're so tired you have a hard time pulling the ball? No. No? No. That's because you train hard. Right, yeah. No, that's that's never been an issue. Um, no, <laughs> but it's because you prepare. Yeah, for the average person, I mean, ninety pounds is it's really difficult to lift. I mean, you're essentially you're using two hands, sort of, mm-hmm. but a, a bulk of the work has got to be in your right arm, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult. You know, where I think would be more difficult is if you're sitting in a tree stand for hours, freezing, mm-hmm. and then a buck walks by and you have a ninety pound bow. That would be hard. That, yeah. that would be because you're not warmed up. You're not, you know, active. So that could be difficult. But I, I did use, I had that bow um, for a late season hunt back home and it was cold. It was like seven degrees and I'd been up there for hours and I'm just like, okay, this is going to be a test now if I can, if I can pull this back and I was able to. And so. Well, it's just because you train so hard. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. If you, if you, if I didn't do what I do every day, there's no way. That's great. I mean, how many other guys are doing that? How many other guys are, are like in shape and treating this almost like a sport? Uh, there's more. You know, there's there's more doing it now, um, especially guys out west. But you know, I get I get emails from Georgia from people. It just you know, and what I found is that, like you talked about earlier, it kind of gives your life purpose. You know, everybody has a job. People have families. And everything else, and and they just kind of. They need to find something that can define them or motivate them. And now all of a sudden training for hunting is something. You yeah. know, before that was, you know, nobody ever did it. So now maybe that is what's making a difference in their life. And so, um, you know, and, and I still get people who they don't like it. They they don't like feeling like they have to train to hunt. And so I get uh, criticized a lot for my approach also. In. What do they say? Oh, what are you doing? Getting in shape? What are you doing? <laughs> Getting strong um, and healthy? Yeah. Asshole. Yeah. How, how, uh, what kind of criticisms do um, they come up with? I would you know, love to hear those. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's pretty, I don't know if it's funny. It's It's been irritating, but I just kind of blow it off. But Has it actually irritated you? Yeah, a little bit. You got to get tougher. <laughs> You gotta work. You no. gotta work on that aspect yeah. of your training. <laughs> okay, I do definitely. But they'll say stuff like, uh, "Oh, Cameron says you have to be able to run a marathon to kill an elk," right? Which is I've never said that. I do that, but you don't have to. And uh, or, you know, I've just I saw something the other day that says, "Oh, 
you know, my approach is what's wrong with hunting today. It's like, I, Whoa, I being, don't, being healthy and strong? I guess, I don't know. Not eating sugar, not drinking alcohol, eating healthy foods and working out. Yeah, you're what's wrong with the world, man. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. all these healthy fuckers <laughs> out there ruining it for everybody else. I know. All these yeah. fat guys like to sit in tree stands and blow farts. <laughs> they're, they're upset. Guys yeah. like you are out there doing something exciting. I guess. I, I don't know. So anyway, yeah, I do get, I get criticized just because... You know, hunting in, in, in hunting for some people is kind of a, just a getaway, mm-hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you want to – it's a vacation. Sure. It's not something you want to gear your life around, and that's okay. I get that. You don't, you don't have to train every day if all you're looking for is just to get away and relax. There's nothing wrong with that in any endeavor, mm-hmm. whether it's a game or a sport or – even martial arts. I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking a martial art class once a week just for exercise. You, mm-hmm. Like my friend Joey Diaz, he's, he's, he's big, he's overweight. He takes jujitsu all the time. He's not trying to get his black belt. He just wants to get, get his blood pumping, mm-hmm. get, a, get a, little, a little workout in there. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. And then I have another friend who's uh, he's beaten world champions. My friend Eddie's uh, you know, a black belt and like one of the best in the world. So it's like those both approaches are okay. Yeah. It's okay to be obsessed with something and, and pursue excellence. And it's okay to just enjoy it as a pastime. Yeah. The problem is that the people that enjoy it as a pastime, they're always going to real. They get this little nagging thing in the back of their head for some of them, like especially the weak ones, that they realize that you do it better than them. Or they realize that if they went hunting with you, they couldn't keep up. Or they realize that if they ran with you, they can't keep up. Or if they realize they tried to lift with you, they couldn't lift as much. Mm -hmm. So they're like crabs in a bucket. You know what crabs in a bucket are like? No. If you have a bunch of crabs in a bucket, one crab tries to get out of the bucket, and the other crabs grab them and pull them down. <laughs> gotcha. And that's what always happens. I guess. It's just, that's the number one problem with the world, is crabs in a bucket. Yeah. The number one problem with this world is people, instead of being inspired, they look to criticize. Mm-hmm. People, instead of looking at someone who works hard and does something amazing, and, and looking at their own life, they find fault, or they find weakness, or they, 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 they find themselves not to add up, not mm-hmm. to measure up. And so they get upset. And instead of finding that inspirational and say, you know what, I do have a belly. I do need to get to the gym. You know what, I do drink too much. I got to stop doing that. Instead of that, they just start shitting on this one thing that causes them to feel insecure. Mm -hmm. Not even realizing that that one thing has the potential to empower them. Right. Now, I I don't know if, I mean, it could be what's going on. A hundred (laughs) percent. Those fat fucks. It's a hundred percent what's going on. It's a hundred percent, man. I know it because I've felt those feelings. I felt I've I've felt insecurity. I felt jealousy. I felt all that, especially as a young man, before mm-hmm. I figured out how how to train my mind and mm-hmm. how to embrace someone who's better than me and embrace someone who inspires me and look for it amongst my peers. Look for it even amongst my enemies. I try to be inspired by people I don't even like. You know, I try to, like, if I find someone that I, I think is, uh, like, someone who's a, a bad comedian, who's a, a joke thief, who's a, but they work hard, I try to t- take that aspect of them that works hard and only concentrate on that and, and find inspiration in it. Mm-hmm. Because then they become valuable to me. Right. You know, then I can see the negative aspect of their behavior and that becomes valuable to me because I realize it reinforces what's bad. But then the good aspects of it, whatever it is, you could find just a, a, something in someone that you don't even like. You could find like something that they do mm-hmm. that that can inspire you. Right, and you know I don't want to. <clears throat> I get mostly all positive, and um, people inspire me. They say that I've helped or motivate them, and this and that. That inspires me also to to. It holds me accountable. You know what I mean? Because now I've created this thing, and it's what I love, but. It also holds me accountable. Like, hey, I got to keep, I got to keep it up for for the people. Yes, you know what I mean. Yes, and um, so that's, I mean, ninety nine percent of what I get is positive, but it seems like you remember the one percent. <laughs> you got to train yourself to not do that. Yeah, that's that's mental training. I it's hear you. Mental training as well as physical <laughs> training. But Be- believe me, man, I've gone through it. And uh, I, what I say is that it's like snake bite venom. Mm-hmm. Like when a snake bites you, if a snake bites you for the first time, I mean, you're fucked. You're, you're sick. You got to go to the hospital. You got to get anti-venom. You, you're in a lot of trouble. But if you just get a little bit of venom, 
A little bit of venom every day over time. After a while, the snake bites you and you're like, bitch, get out of here. That shit ain't going <laughs> to work up on tolerance. me. Yeah. Yep. You gotcha. develop the ability to understand what it is. Yeah. And I feel sorry for people when I sh- just see ridiculous criticism. I laugh. Like, someone will come into my office sometimes. Like, my wife's like, what are you laughing at? I'm like, oh, some guy's making fun of me. It's just hilarious. <laughs> I just reading what they say about me makes me laugh. Yeah. If, if I really thought they were right, it would bother me. Right. But if I, you know, if I have done what I need to do and I've done all the work and I, I've assessed myself and I'm objective – then I can find folly in their weakness. Right, yeah. But you. you're an inspirational dude for sure because you inspired me. Uh, oh, I saw some thanks. of your videos. Uh, I said, I, I like a guy who's going for things. I like a guy who's, it's not easy to run an ultra marathon. It's not easy to take a 130-pound rock, put it in a pack, and walk up to the top of the hill. When I see people doing stuff like that, I get like this, it like ramps up inside me and I, mm-hmm. I want to go work out. I want to go do something. I want to get shit done. Mm-hmm. I think... People like you are really important. The, the, the type of people that do things like that, they, they provide energy for countless other people, whether you're aware of it or not. You know, I know that you did to me, so I know that I'm not unique in that. And I know that other people who watch your videos feel the same way. They get excited about it, and you cause motion. You cause, you cause effort. Because of what you've done, you get people excited, and that inspiration actually causes things to, to take place. Yeah, well, th- thanks. Um, this is, you know, it's what I love to do. It's, um, and it's just preparing for crunch time, basically, getting out there and preparing to, to be the ultimate predator, not, not fail when all the, pre- you know, like when we're filming for a TV show, um, there's a lot of pressure. These hunts can be expensive. You're traveling a long way away from your family there's a lot at stake there's a guy with you who's being paid there's a big investment so i don't want to i don't want to fail when it comes down to that moment not only for me but for other people who sacrifice so that's that's basically what the work's about and i think it's cool too that you feel that people are inspired by these things and it it actually like motivates you to to ramp it up another notch Mm -hmm. to keep it going even further oh yeah no i i don't i haven't hit my ceiling you know i'm trying to get better every day just such a badass manly approach to life you know elk hunting with a bow uh, and being an expert at that that's do you have a, a regular job yeah what's yep. your regular job i'm supposed to be at work right now actually oh really you got <laughs> off you you got a good boss no that they say think i'm sick oh really no they're gonna <laughs> find out <laughs> this is this is a bad move then <laughs> no 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 um let's see yeah i'm a buyer for the local water and power company back home so i've done that for 18 years so you do that 40 hours a week. Yep. And so how do you find the time to do all this other stuff? Just make it happen. Wow. Yeah. It's just what I do. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know how it goes. I'm sure you've been there before where if, if I don't get my workout in or if I don't do it, I'm just in a bad mood. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Cause I, and uh, so we just make time to make it happen. And uh, it's just what I do. Well, there's a, the other part about working out, about the bad mood part, is mm-hmm. that your body sort of develops this... Uh, this habit of of p- pumping out energy right you know like when you get in shape and you get your body like really fit and you get your body used to exerting these you know these big explosive bursts of energy like lifting or jujitsu or what, whatever it is your body sort of like ramps up for that and then is like hey where's my release right you know like hey we're ready to go hey we're ready to go why are we in a fucking office man like <laughs> w- what's going on here i'm yeah. going to kill something i'm going to shoot a bow at somebody what's going on why can't i lift weights yeah hey hey this is kind of crazy and you you don't have that release and i think our bodies are probably designed for a certain amount of that being that we were you know, for who knows how many thousands of years, we were hunter-gatherers, and we essentially share the same DNA as those human beings that lived 30, 40,000 years ago. It's not much of a difference between us and them. There's got to be a lot of the old reward, the, 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 the reward mechanisms of life, like, still in our DNA. And I think that people who don't exercise those reward mechanisms, you're missing out on a, a, a lot of what it is to be a person, a lot of what it is to be like excited by life it's um there's something like pretty intense about uh just fulfilling those reward mechanisms right. and i think hunting is one of those that i didn't realize until i started hunting I, I really didn't realize like what an intense uh connection 
your your like your 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 mind. I want to say your spirit, but that's a, the fucking that's a word that's been hijacked <laughs> by so many shitheads wearing crystals around their neck. Yeah. But it, it seems like th- there's something in you that g- like it opens up this weird path that like oh you didn't even know this was there. Mm-hmm. This this predator path, this path of connection to the animals, a connection to the wild world, going out there and, and getting an animal and eating it. And, and I don't even mean it in like a macho, like, look how cool I am way. I, mean, I really mean it in a spiritual way. There's mm-hmm. this weird spiritual connection you have to the Mother Earth when it provides for you, to the animals of the wild itself when you go out and you get one and then you, you use it for sustenance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and that's, you know, people who think it's just about getting meat like I heard, I think you were talking with John Hackleman. He didn't really understand hunting at all. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, he, you know, did they think it's, it's akin to going to the store and buying a steak? Mm-hmm. It couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, it's the exact opposite of that, it, really. Yeah, you're, you're getting meat and yeah, you're eating it, but it's the, it's a connection. It's the, it's everything else that's, that it's all about. That's where the power comes from. And, uh, man, without that, I don't know. I mean, that's everything to me. That's that's my life. You know, just gearing up for that is what I do. So, well, I do a lot of exciting things. I'm I'm a very fortunate person, and whether it's stand up comedy or whether it's uh, working for the UFC, um, the things that I do, I truly love doing, and they're very exciting things. I mean, when it, when the UFC starts, when the fights are going on, I I never feel like I should be anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Like I'm I'm always very excited to be there. Hunting's even more exciting than that. Yeah. The, and it's, it's accessible to everyone, whereas, like, not everybody gets to be the commentator for the UFC. I'm right. uh, Lucky for me, I'm the only one. Or, you know, there's a couple other guys that do it when I'm not doing it, but... They're not as good. Thank you very much. Appreciate <laughs> that. I, I, I think a lot of them are really good, but that's to me. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, that's a, a, a job that maybe five people on the planet get to do, right. as far as do commentary for MMA. Three in the UFC. B- but... Hunting is everybody can do it. Yeah, a lot of people can do it. Yeah, you know, and you—that's the other thing that I really like about your approach. You go on public land. Mm-hmm. You, you, you do it in the the national forests. You do it in the areas where they're accessible to all these folks. Yeah, you can you can get a, a, a tag just like everybody else. You get your license just like everybody else, mm-hmm. and you go out there and it's, you know, you're not like doing one of these canned hunts. This is uh, this is. This is really like the American wilderness that you're entering into. Yeah, and that's, you know, know, I have, so I've had guides, like when I go someplace where guides required Canada or or different places, but uh, where I basically made a name for myself was in the wilderness by myself onto those solo hunts. And, you know, to tell you the truth, I was worried, I think, let's see, I wrote an article, is either 99 or 2000, I went with my buddy South Cox, He's from California here. The dude should change his name. <laughs> no, no, he's a stud. At least North Cox is like. <laughs> South's a stud. Yeah, what but, the fuck? Your parents hate him or something? It, Why would you call him South Cox? <laughs> it's COX. Oh, so whatever. That... <laughs> Courtney. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, we went and we both killed good bulls and I killed a buck also. And I wrote this article about it and the, the photos were awesome. Um, the uh, Just the whole experience is good. And I thought, this is going to screw up my hunting because this is public land. This is Eagle Cap Wilderness. And uh, this is probably the last time this hunting is ever going to be good because people are going to see this and they're going to want to do it. And now where I didn't see anybody for years, um, there's going to be tons of people. Well, next year came around, went back in there, there's nobody there. And so, you know, I ended up writing a book about that type of hunting and still nobody was there. And the bottom line is, yes, it's available to everybody, but it's very tough, and you're near 12 miles from the nearest road, and you're living off your back in some of the most unforgiving country there is. That's just never easy, and so people try it. You know, I've taken I've taken friends back there who who I wanted to love it as much as I do, and you know we're back there for a day, two days, and they're like, dude, I'm ready to go, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm like, what are you talking about? You're ready. This is this is how this is as good as it gets. They're like, um, this is, isn't what I expected. It's going to be feet like, hurt. <laughs> yeah, no. And so the thing about it is just because you love it, not everybody's going to love right. it. And yeah. it's, it's something that you can't make them. No. And so they see the photos, they see the video, they see the animals and they're like, man, that is awesome. I want to do that too. Unless it's in you, 
it's just going to be a struggle. And so yeah, it, it like, is a, it is available, but it's it's still tough. It's like taking someone who's a rap fan to your favorite country concert. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Jesus, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and you're like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be, yeah, it's not for everybody. But. Well, that's the beautiful thing about life. There's a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. There's so much variety. There's so many different things that you could be into. The, you know, one of the real problems with life is people want you to be into what they're into. Right. And if you're not into what they're into, there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Or if they're not into what you're into, there's something wrong with you. Right. You know? but, but the thing about that is I don't need anybody to be into it. So I was just like, so I, my buddy um, Roy, who I started hunting in the wilderness with, he moved to Alaska. And he's just a stud. That was, he was my partner. We, we both like had the same mindset that there's no sacrifice too great. We can't be in enough pain. It doesn't even matter. And he moved. So I'm like, okay, I need to find some. I tried to find somebody to take. And eventually I figured out there's nobody like Roy Roth. So I'm just either going to quit hunting there or go on my own. And so I just was like, it's, you know, it's on my own. And so it is, that's where I started doing the, the solo wilderness hunts. And, uh, um, you know, it's, like I said, it's a good thing about you don't need anybody else. People don't like doing it because you're so far out of your comfort zone. We're so distracted with everything that's going on in the regular world that being in the wilderness where there's nothing is overwhelming for a lot of people. It's just, I mean, it's, it's difficult mentally. Yeah, um, just being alone in the wilderness has got to be like a, a very rare experience. Like people freak the fuck out when they're alone in the wilderness. That's a scary thing for them because they worry about getting trapped. They worry about getting injured, not being able to get out. No one's going to be able to find them. Like if you don't have a satellite phone and a backup satellite phone and a handgun, just mm -hmm. to, there's a, a lot of fear involved in being in the actual wild itself. Yeah, I, and they they worry about stuff. They make up stuff to worry about. Mm. I mean, just to just to give them a way out. And so you know, that was a bit, and that was that was true for me too. I mean, it was overwhelming for me. I didn't go back in there in the mountains for a 10-day solo hunt right out of the gate. I went for like one night. Like I went on a scouting trip and then stayed one night then came out. And it's just kind of baby steps into it because um, it's, you know, if you, if you pulled, you know, I don't know how many people there are here in L.A., but how many people have stayed out overnight in the mountains by themselves? It's not going to be very many people. I mean, it's, I don't know, five. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I mean, it's, it's just not something people do in this day and age. And so it's because it's, you know, it's, you're out of your comfort zone. But if you can do that, and that's I, I became good at that, and actually, then I, 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 I loved it. I remember, let's see, it was, uh, um, let me think. What I don't know, what, whatever I can't remember the year, but I killed a, a six by six bull elk by myself, and it was my best bull. And I got out of the wilderness, had this little Toyota four wheel drive. I had this this bull loaded up, and I was just so pumped. Finally, got cell service out on the highway, and I'm driving home, and uh, I called my wife, and I was like. I was like, hey, Trace, I killed a six by six bull. And she's like, Princess Di died. I'm like, what? She's like, Princess Di died. I go, who cares? <laughs> I killed a six by six bull. And it was just like, I, you're so, you know, to everybody else, Princess Diana dying was just like, you know, the world's going to stop. But when you're back in the wilderness and you killed a six by six bull elk, nothing else matters. And that's, I just remembered that's, the difference between living back there where it's just about, am I going to find a place to sleep tonight? Am I going to be warm? And will I have food? That's it. That's all you care about. Well, we're inundated by information these days. We have like constant information coming at us from all around the world. The 7 billion people in the entire planet provide stories. So anytime anything happens that's interesting or extraordinary or scary or disgusting... You're going to hear about it. Mm -hmm. And if you just sit in front of your computer like I do some days, like some days, man, I get on Twitter and I just can't stop clicking. <laughs> I'm just like, what? That's not real. Oh, my God, it is real. Holy <laughs> shit. And I retweet it. And, yeah. and then, you know, like you you could lose your day. Your yeah. day, it doesn't exist. What you're doing is just in. you're just collecting all this information from around the world. Mm -hmm. But it's not your life. 
your life is just Cameron Haynes, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Yeah. What do I see through my eyes? Yeah. Where, you know, who's around me? Who, where are my loved ones? Mm-hmm. That, that's your real life. That's it. But, you know, you're sitting and wondering about whether or not, what if when you shot the arrow, right as that arrow hit that bull, Princess Di died? That Wouldn't would that be, be fucked. Oh, that'd be crazy. That'd be strange. Maybe somehow, some way, I killed her. Maybe. Yeah, it's some, look, the stranger things have happened. <laughs> If you know, if you believe in those things, if you believe in uh, the synchronicities of the world, that would be crazy. That would be that would be qu- quite poetic. If because if your wife's like Princess Di died, and you're like, yeah, I know, yeah, <laughs> right through the lungs, it was a double lung. She was in the form of an elk. She was a mm-hmm. spiritual elk. Right. <laughs> she she bugled, and I, I I shot one right through the lungs. Hey, she was hot, but not not as hot as that <laughs> bull elk at that moment. So it was, I don't know. I don't know. It had, maybe if that was like a like an eight by nine bull elk, it could have been her. I don't think you're supposed to say she was hot. I think it's, she was royal. She was not really hot. She had some royal hotness. You think so? I think so. Not my type. <laughs> See, I don't think she could just die. Down. I don't think she could get down. I thought I thought she was partying when she she died in a car wreck, right? Well, she was running away from the press, right? Wasn't it like a paparazzi yeah. situation? With the boyfriend I don't think she or something. was partying. Yeah, she had a boyfriend, right? Yeah. Was it was that what was up? She was breaking up with Princess Charles and she was her life was in turmoil. That makes her hot? <laughs> it's not know. my type. I'm not into that kind of chick. Okay. She she doesn't seem like she could get down. But that's just me. <laughs> I mean, all due respect. Rest in peace, Mrs. Dodd. <laughs> yeah. That's a thing, though, man. People do really get caught up. Like, uh, m- my wife tried to tell me some stupid celebrity shit the other day, and she was going on about something. That she, Can you believe it? This said that and that. Said, I'm like, hey, man, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I literally don't give zero. I give zero fucks. Like, yeah. Let's stop talking about this. There's so much shit to talk about. But no. those salacious, gossipy things... It gets people so interested. It becomes so fascinating. They become overwhelming. I'm guilty of it too, man. Somebody put some thread on my uh, message board the other day about, uh, it's probably bullshit, but it might be true, that Bill Clinton had an affair with Elizabeth Hurley. Did you see that? (laughs) Man, I thought about that shit all day. I thought about it all day. I kept going back to the thread, seeing what what recent what new developments. First of all, I got two things out of that. First of all, Tom Sizemore can't keep a fucking secret. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't tell Sizemore who you're banging, because that motherfucker spills the beans. Don't trust heroin addicts with the truth. That's one thing. I'll write that down. Yeah, trust me. And the, the other thing is, I think that Bill Clinton is the last of the great American presidential dick slingers. That's it. Playboys. It ends with him. Mm-hmm. There's no, the, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. We are going to be reduced to a see. Not that there's anything good about being that guy, because obviously he was kind of a creeper. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he Bill Clinton was one of those weird guys that would just like whip it out on girls. Like if you talk to, I didn't talk to, but if you read some of the accounts of some of those women that were like really angry at him from Arkansas. He would get alone with them and just whip it out. There's him and Hurley. For sure he hit that, right? <laughs> God damn. Woo! But that's it. We're not going to have any more of those those guys. No, no. And you know, you're talking about different things. Here's how, how it uh, affects me. So people talk about, well, Obama did this, this or that. I'm like, okay, do I have to go to work tomorrow? Because if, if I have to go to work tomorrow, not much has changed in my life. Mm. If I don't have to go to work, for some reason, then I'll start paying attention. That's how, yeah. that's how I figure it out. Well, that's a good way to look at your own life. Uh, and that's a good way to, to manage your own life. The problem, of course, is that this is supposed to be some sort of a community. Our, our country is supposed to be some big, giant community. And the people that are running this community, that are in charge of dictating the rules and the regulations, are clearly screwing it up. Mm-hmm. Clearly. This is not the optimum way to run any country. I don't know if it's possible to optimally run a country with the mess that's been created before the people that got into power, in power, before, before they got into positions of, 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 of having any control. There's probably so much bureaucracy and crazy shit behind the scenes as far as like special interest groups and lobbyists and the, the massive web is probably so deep you could never hack through it all, clean it all up. And, and come up with some sort of a rational system. So you got two options. 
One, you could obsess on it and work feverishly until your fucking heart stops beating and then you die an angry person. This system sucks. Yeah. Boom. And it pop, your heart blows in your chest and you fall down and shit your pants and, and die in agony. Or you just live your life saying, okay, I'm going to leave that shit to somebody else. Let them run it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to go wandering through the woods with pointy sticks. I like your approach better. Well, I think whoever is running the country, <laughs> they'd do a, a much better job if they were bow hunters. If they had been in the mountains and actually tried to survive and then maybe even killed an animal and, and that was took it back to their family, I think they'd probably be a better commander-in-chief. I think that's probably true. I think if they were a martial artist, they'd probably be a better commander-in-chief. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Putin. I think Putin is kind of a psycho, but... I respect the fact that he's a black belt in judo and he is, a, you know, he's a real martial artist and he, he sort of carries himself in that way. Mm -hmm. Like if Obama and Putin were going to throw down, Putin would fuck Obama up. <laughs> that bothers me. That, that disturbs me, you yeah. know? I, I, I wish my president could kick a little ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, Not it's, that it's the most important thing in the world, but... Supposedly he plays basketball, which every video clip I've seen of him playing basketball, he looks like he sucks at that too, so... Supposedly he plays pool and I, I'll, I'll fucking give him the six out and the breaks... Anytime he wants to gamble, let's do it. Let's do it, Obama. <laughs> Come on, you got a spot. I think. Um, I think that any any like very very difficult thing that anybody does, whether it's bow hunting or martial arts or anything where it's incredibly difficult to accomplish something, it sort of separates the 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 people that will quit from the people that figure out a way to succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's really that that overcoming adversity is that's where character comes from. And that's the things that we all admire. Mm -hmm. And that shit's hardwired into us, man. The admiration of that like just as simple as me watching your video of you carrying that rock up a hill. I mean, is it important that you carry that rock up a hill in the greater s scheme of the universe? No, it's not. But to me, it was. Because to me, that day, I was like, this motherfucker's doing some shit that I probably can't do right now. <laughs> <laughs> and when you see that, it yeah. like, makes you like, I want to be able to carry that rock up the hill. All right, well, if I'm going to fucking start out with a 35-pound plate, I'm going to carry that up the hill. I'm yeah. going to work my way up to that big rock. And that you know that inspiring each other and the the ability to push yourself to these incredible heights is really one of the more exciting aspects of being a person mm -hmm. it's one of the things that makes being a man or a woman i mean i guess being a woman i'm not a woman so i don't know i thought about it sometimes what it would be like <laughs> um but it, it makes it it, it it makes it gives you thrills it gives you excitement it gives you like these these feelings of accomplishment when you achieve things they're they're some of the the greatest moments in life mm -hmm. and i feel bad for people that have never stuck their neck out i feel bad for people that have never taken chances not because they're less because they're not less they're just they haven't reached their potential it's not that right. their their potential is less I, f I feel like probably inside all of us we all have the potential for greatness in one way or another. As yeah. long as we don't have any v obvious physical problems, we, we didn't get dealt a, a terrible genetic hand of cards mm -hmm. you know, with a disease or something like that. But if you don't have that, I think all of us have potential. We just, d we, I feel bad for people who don't at least attempt to reach a potential in some way. Yeah, and that's, you know, for me, I, don't, I didn't feel, I don't feel like I'm any different from anybody else, you know, because I've been... Yeah. Back in my early 20s, I remember I signed up for a 10K race, 6.2 miles back home, and quit. I mean, I was had been partying. I was, I don't know what, 19 or 20, and uh, it's just whatever, not in shape. And I'm like, why am I doing this? And stepped off the course. And that I've never forget, I'll never forget what that moment felt like being a quitter. And that that was, that is crazy. But the point is, is... So if I've been that guy who quit a six mile race and I've come and now, you know, have done, you know, what I, what I can do or what I finally believe or figured out I could do, anybody can, you know what I mean? I'm not like crazy talented or, or have all this ability that just is natural. It's just, but it's what I, what I'm doing and what I chase and what I work for every day. And I've been able to achieve what some might consider, you know, big accomplishments and, I'm just a regular guy. You're a regular guy, but you're a regular guy who puts it out there. And when you put it out there, that's what creates that energy. That's what creates that inspiration. That's what creates action. 
because people will watch your video and go, man, I'm going to the fucking gym. Mm -hmm. And they'll go to the gym and they'll start lifting weights or they'll do whatever it is that they do, that they, they'll get inspired by your hard work. They'll mm -hmm. watch that video of you getting up early in the morning and going running when you don't want to. Right. And they see you tired. Everybody feels that. Everybody's seen that alarm clock go off or heard that alarm clock go off. I'm like, I do not want to get up now. That Everybody knows that feeling. Mm -hmm. But it's overcoming that feeling. Right. It's developing that muscle of discipline where you look at that alarm, you hit it, and you just, just get, up. get up. You know, I had an ex-girlfriend um, back when I was fighting who uh, she, she used to get angry at the way I would get up. Because, uh, you know, she had to work, and I, I, I was a comedian. I had, you know, a bunch of different, like, small-time jobs. But when I would get up, I'd get up angry. Because mm -hmm. I, I had sort of I had this thing that I would do in the morning, like, before my morning workouts and I was training. I would, uh, the alarm clock goes up, and I would get up like my life depended on it. So the alarm would go off. I'd hit it, and I'd just fucking jump out of bed like the house is on fire. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, that's the way to do it. Because anything else is weak. Right. Like, I had a, I had a real problem when I was young. Like, I didn't want it. I was so crazy when I was comp I, I competed in martial arts from the time I was like 15 till I was 22. That's all I did. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was so crazy that I thought it was weak to want sex. That, like, wanting sex with my girlfriend was like a weakness and that pleasure was a weakness mm -hmm. wanting to taste good food was a weakness right and so i was going to be miserable i was fucking crazy i was completely yeah. crazy but i would uh, that alarm clock would get up uh, the alarm clock would go off and i would get up angry yeah i would get up angry and urgent and that's how i'd wake up i'd just wake up instantly <clears throat> <clears throat> we gotta go and i'd get my shoes on and do my run or whatever i did that day in the morning yeah. and you know and she would go will you fucking stop doing that you <laughs> fucking drive me crazy you get up i think the house is on fire or something like that yeah, she she's overacting. Got rid of that bitch. Got a better one. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't she was overacting. I was fucking crazy. I wouldn't yeah. have wanted to hang out with me when I was nineteen. I was a fucking maniac. Yeah, but you know that <laughs> that's probably better than hitting that fucking snooze button ten times in a row. Yeah, you know the developing the discipline, the the muscle of discipline. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get that through inspiration. I get that through knowing that they're like watching a video of you seeing that alarm clock go off, knowing that you're tired, getting up and working out. Mm -hmm. Like you, you uh, Instagrammed a picture from Vegas when you were at the shot show. Yeah. You're looking totally exhausted and you're lifting weights. I'm like, yeah. fuck yeah, he's doing it. That's yeah. what you got to do. Yeah. You're not, you don't want to lift weights? Good. Go lift weights. Yeah. You know, you're tired. There's you always, always an excuse. Fuck yeah, there's always an excuse. Yeah. But when you get through it, you realize like, it's life is a lot of times not about doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Life is about doing what you what you're supposed to do or what you should do, and then knowing that when you want to do it, it'll be even easier. Then, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, you know, that's part of my my routine. And people always ask, well, so what do you do? What's your you know routine for getting in shape? Well, it's, I'm like, it's real simple. Actually, I got it on my shirt right lift, here. Lift, run, shoot. I lift, run, shoot every day. Well, what about, okay, so every day, every day. You don't take Sundays off? Nothing? <laughs> every day. You don't take a day off a week for anything? Every day. Wow. That's <laughs> interesting. I need to, me? I, I take should some add fucking days off. Every day to the bottom. I take days off, son. I like days off. And people, I, people <laughs> post, <laughs> hey, I would like days off too, but I can't do it. I just can't, can't do it mentally. No, can't really? do it. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. But, uh, and, and people, this one guy I remember, he posted on my, I don't know where it was. Facebook, I think. He's like, he's like, yeah, you know, I've been following you for a long time, but you know, everything you're doing now is just too much. I'm like, too much what? Too much for who? For, too much for you, or too much for, for everybody? And so that was like my whole thing is now I want to I want to be the guy who does too much because how do you do too much? Right, right, right. Too much for? I mean, who determines? Is there a council that says okay, it's been determined you're doing too much? So. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we what we used to think is too much is now the norm. Right. You know, I mean, if you stop and look at like as far as like exercise, like think about like what people used to do for exercise and now what people do now. Like mm -hmm. no one trains harder than MMA fighters. Right. And MMA fighters, the you know, if you deal with a guy like say uh, you know, a George St. Pierre or a John Jones, they're training twice a day at least mm -hmm. at least twice a day yeah and they'll take off recovery days or uh like randy couture 
he used to take very few uh, off days, he would do what he would call active recovery. Mm -hmm. So instead of wrestle, lift weights, maybe he would go mountain biking. You know, maybe he would do something like, yeah. you know, something like where he's moving, he's getting some exercise in it, but he would do like what he would call an active recovery day. Maybe mm -hmm. he'd go hiking, you know, it would still work, but you're forcing your body to understand that your body, this is what you do, dude. This is what your body does. Yeah. And it might, I mean, for those guys, especially, and it might be for one minute. Mm-hmm. Their fight might be over in a minute. Yeah, could be. So they're doing all, you know, like I watched Uriah the other night. I know how hard he works and first round mm -hmm. over. Yep. That very that was a very unfortunate ending too. Um, you, and, and it was very unfortunate for Uriah in a lot of ways. First of all, he went into that camp um, right after the McDonald fight and he had an injured knee and an injured hamstring entering mm -hmm. into the Burrell fight. Mm -hmm. So he had a pulled muscle in his hamstring, a partial tear, mm -hmm. and uh, his knee was fucked up. So he couldn't wrestle. So not the most optimum conditions to be fighting, not just for a world title, but against easily one of the four baddest motherfuckers to oh, walk the yeah. face of the planet. That yeah. Hennon Barrow is oh, a, he is a beast. Yeah. That kid is so good. Mm -hmm. And he hit Uriah with one leg kick early in the fight. And you see Uriah's <laughs> leg give out. You see that like that limp that there's a limp that a guy gets when you yeah. know that shin really slammed into the meat of the muscle. Mm -hmm. There's this like stutter step that they give. I was like, oh boy. Yeah. It's long not good. long night for Uriah. <laughs> and then he got tagged. Yeah. T and even worse that unfortunately he got Steve Rinella. Do you know Steve Rinella? Yeah. Hey man, I'm doing a fucking podcast with Cameron Haynes. I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, call me. <laughs> Maybe he wanted to get he wanted to get on there. Yeah, probably. He's like, listen, this guy's full of shit. You need a sixty pound <laughs> bow and that's it. This guy's a maniac. <laughs> Stop all your lifting. This dude's a goddamn billy goat. We yeah. went pig hunting uh two weeks ago. And uh, you know, just following him up the hills. Mm -hmm. Jesus, he doesn't get tired. Yeah, he's 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 has no muscle mass. You know, he's just th thin guy. Yeah, but he can go for days. Right, for days. Yeah, he just doesn't get tired. You know, right. I was I was shocked when we were uh, in Montana because I'm in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. But I would follow him up these hills, and I'd be like, <sighs> and he'd be like, <laughs> nothing, not not even breathing heavy. Yeah, that that's what really got me onto this idea of uh, of exercise and hunting being together. And that hunting is a difficult thing. Is that you carrying this? Uh, yeah. Look at the horns on that thing. Oh my god, those antlers are giant. Doing lunges there. Is that what you're doing? No. No, you're just picking it up. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to do it, though, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, is that is there any exercise that you do specifically to deal with the fact that you've got so much weight on your back? Because when you're packing out like that, and didn't you're we talk about the rock? Yeah, but I mean, what I'm saying is to compensate for that, not just doing that and carrying mm. the rock, but is there any other, like, do you do, like, um, like those Roman chair exercises or something to strengthen your lower back? Because it seems like, like your core mm -hmm. and a lot, of, uh, a lot of the areas of your back are really taxed, your mm -hmm. spine, carrying a lot of weight on, your, uh, on a pack like that. Well, I mean, I'm working core all the, all the time from planks to all the lifts that I do to... Shooting a bow is can be core, you know. It is. I mean, you're hold, when trying to hold steady. You're you're engaging your core. So, yeah, I do in in running the mountain. So whether I have the rock or not, I'm running that mountain. And when you're on an uneven trail and you're juking around and stepping in holes, you know, you're engaging your core. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course we do you know different regular lifts, uh, deadlifts, and whatever else. So, I don't know. I try to mix it up. Yeah, I would I would imagine that there's a, a lot of crazy muscle groups involved in not just carrying that uh, that rock out, but just in shooting that bow. Do you balance out your body because you're pulling so hard on your right side? Do you ever pull your bow just with your left side no. just to to balance it out? Mm -mm. No, I just I think the lifting helps that. You know, I mean, because lifting is pretty much you're engaging both sides equally. So the bow the bow just is what it is. I probably. I probably am a little unbalanced, but you wouldn't be able to tell. But just from, you know, 27 years of doing it or whatever it's been. Yeah, uh, my friend Steve Maxwell, who's a 
pretty famous strength and conditioning expert. Uh, he wor- he works with a lot of people that uh, have imbalances, like kickers mm-hmm. in the NFL. Right. And he gets them to kick at the opposite side. Oh. And one of the things that they found is that when you uh, use your weaker side, mm-hmm. um, you know, like say if you have a strong side, and they, they, they found this with jujitsu as well, it actually enhances your ability on your strong side. Hmm. So um, if you, uh, I, I find that playing pool too. I shoot pool left-handed sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm playing my daughter or if I'm playing someone who sucks, I'll shoot mm-hmm. pool left-handed. And yeah. then sometimes when left-handed comes up, like if there's a shot that I can't reach right-handed, I'll, I'll shoot it left-handed. There you go. And if I practice left-handed, then my right hand becomes better hmm. because I'm concentrating. I have to concentrate so hard to use my left hand because it's all like, yeah. conf- it doesn't know how to move right. It's oh, all yeah. goofy. Yeah. It's not thinking right. And my right hand just whoosh, falls right into place. Yeah. They say that it, using your weak side actually enhances your mm. strong side, using your, your less dominant side. Yeah, I, I don't know if I could shoot a bow. I mean, I know you could. <laughs> don't say you couldn't. You could well, 100%. Yeah, no. I, I would bet everything I own that you could shoot a bow left hand. The only difference in between that is, you know, you have your dominant eye. Yes. Right? So to shoot left handed, I'd have to use what isn't my dominant eye. I'd have to use my left eye to aim. Yeah, I don't think that'd be a problem. You know what I started doing recently at the range? I started shooting left-handed because I was shooting so many rounds with my right that I was fucking up my right shoulder. Oh, really? The 300 Win Mag. Oh, I, oh I, yeah, yeah. I yeah. was slamming that thing into my shoulder so many times. I was like, let me just fucking shoot a bunch of rounds lefty. That's why rifle hunting is bad. Because <laughs> the, 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 the shock, the impact, just get a muzzle break. It's too noisy. It's definitely noisy. <laughs> but I got these cool uh, earphones that you yeah. listen to. Um, they're... Um, they're, they they cancel the sound out except talking. Oh, okay. Like the sound of gunshots gets muffled radically. Perfect. But I could hear you loud and clear mm-hmm. if you're talking to me. Like I, it actually, I can hear you louder than I could with my ears. Mm. It actually enhances the sound. Mm. Yeah, my friend Justin, who's a gun nut, told me about them. They're they're incredible. Justin Martindale. No, no, this different. <laughs> that 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 could, he's a different kind of gun nut. <laughs> Justin call it. Justin Martindale's a different kind of gun nut. Yeah. But he is a gun nut. <laughs> Science. Mm-hmm. But um I found that like shooting lefty, like practicing left handed, it made me like so happy that I could go back to right handed because yeah. I was so much better at it. Hmm. You know? I think that if you uh well you're so good at shooting bow and arrow anyway, but if you did start shooting left handed, I bet it would make your right hand better. Yeah, maybe. Have you ever thought about getting Hoyt to make you a left-handed bow? I think they'd do it. Let's do it. Let's call Hoyt up. I just want to thank uh, you and Hoyt for bringing me this awesome bow. Hoyt, which is one of the best bow manufacturers on earth, brought uh, this Hoyt Carbon Spider Turbo for me, and it is amazing. We shot a couple shots. We actually have a little bit of an archery set up back here Mm -hmm. in the back of the uh, studio, so we shot a couple of targets with it, but this bow is sick. Yeah, I have one just like it. It's amazing, man. It's really, really awesome. It feels I, great. I bought. The, I brought the Factor. This yeah, is yours the, is ninety pounds. Mine, the one you brought me, is seventy pounds, which makes me feel like a little girl. I have money. to ramp it up. Yeah, <laughs> that thing's incredible. Yeah. I was amazed at how hard that is to pull back too. That's really hard. Yeah, I mean, it's like it, you know, it really is like doing a ninety-pound row. It's yeah, like, you know. Yeah, I know. It's and it's a lot of its technique. You know, you want to push at the left, pull with the right, but. Yeah, it's got a lot of power. That's uh, I built that or had them build that for me for, to hunt those uh, water buffalo in Australia, and then I'm going to use it in Africa on Cape Buffalo too. Yeah, so. Jamie had that video up. Jamie pulled that video up so you could see that uh, water buffalo. There's a, It's a long stalk, a long patient stalk on this mm-hmm. buffalo, and I would imagine you would want to get a bunch of trees between you and him just in case shit got hairy <laughs> and you had a duck behind one of those trees. Yeah, the, the thing about this, so these animals here – is they catch they catch movement so if if they're not looking while you're moving they don't they can't pick that up so it's about going slow and then if he looks of course i stop so it's just about it's like right here so i stop because his head's up and so he can see out of his eye i'm not moving now he puts his head down and one thing that i that i figured out on these things is they might put their head down and pretend like they're eating but really they're looking. So you got to be able to tell he'll have his head down, but if he's not ripping grass side to side, he's not eating. He's just testing me. So he might have maybe picked something up, but he put his head down, but his mouth wasn't moving. So I just stop. I'm like, okay, you're trying to, you're trying to (laughs) catch me here. But, um, as long as they don't see you move, you can, you can walk right up right there. And I get to 40, 
I'm not sure what we're filming here, but we get to 46 yards. And uh, the crazy thing about this is, is I wanted to let his his leg go forward so I can slip that arrow in as his legs forward, opening up his vitals. And I waited too long, and you can watch this arrow, and it clips a tree in between me and it. And it hit the arrow hit a little lower than what I wanted because it hit that tree. But because I have you know ninety pounds and so much force, it was it ricocheted, caught a little bit of energy from that tree, it was lessened, but it still went in and heart shot on that buffalo. Yeah, here it is when you're shooting it. Yeah, so watch watch that tree, the the curved one. So I want his leg to go forward. And it, oh, so you barely it barely it. barely caught that. But if I would have had less poundage, that could have. So right there, it's, that's a heart shot on him. And he has no idea what happened. So he's taken off. And the, their vitals, that looks like a bad shot. Like if you were hunting elk, that would be too forward and too low. But on those, that's where the that's where the uh, the heart is. So Bas you have to know the, basically the right organs. Through, yeah, it's a little bit different on those animals than what we're here in North America. And so you see he's going to run into a tree here. He's pretty wobbly and so i don't know how many seconds this was but you got a 2,000 pound animal with the, just a razor sharp stick and he's down in you know a minute maybe a minute and a half that's that's a lot quicker than they're ever going to die in a natural habitat on their own well, no doubt and that's one thing that people need to understand when you're talking about animals and hunting animals uh in you know people that are opposed to it they need to understand first of all that in order to, you, to do proper conservation, to take care of these animals, to make sure that their herds, the population is strong, you have to cull some of the animals. You mm -hmm. have to, because otherwise they're going to die of starvation. They're going to, you know, they're going to get diseased. There's there's a lot of issues involved if you're not introducing predators. And then if you introduce predators to take care of the population, well, then you got a whole nother problem, mm -hmm. obviously. And uh, and they're actually seeing that right now in parts of this country with uh, with wolves. When they reintroduce wolves, I mean, they're they're really ramping up wolf hunting now in Idaho. Oh yeah, no, because the wolves are just tearing up elk. Yeah, and it's yeah it's, decimating populations. Yeah, and you know, like in Australia, there um, there's no predators, so those buffalo there there's too many of them right now. There's no limit on buffalo. You don't need a tag. You don't need a license. They just want them killed because they're they're not native. Those are Asian water buffalo, so they were brought over to Australia. They're not native, and so there's so many of them where there once was water and there's fish and all sorts of things. Now it's just basically a, a mud hole because those buffalo get in there, and you know they they piss in there, they do live in there, killed everything. So they tear up uh, the habitat, they tear up the water, they ruin the water source. And so now they just want them killed. So when I was over there, I killed three of those big old things and you could kill 20 of them if you want. They, they need them gone. Wow. Well, that's the same thing with New Zealand as well, right? New Zealand has an issue with non-native species. Yeah. 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 That's, a, you know, you know, there's only, if I don't know, there's tons of non-native species in uh, Australia. I think, let's see, the guy I was with, Adam Greentree, he killed, a, it's not a dingo, but it's uh Sort of like a dingo, but it's not a purebred because those are protected. But uh, see that kangaroo? Look how yoked he is. Yeah, he is like kangaroo is up. following the Cameron Haynes program. <laughs> yeah. Look at him. That's I would not want to tangle with that kangaroo, no, man. That's he, you don't need to be that jack to be a kangaroo. See, he's he's wasting his time. He's getting crazy. <laughs> no, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's it was it was good getting over there and seeing different animals and and learning from uh let's see Adam Greentree and Owen Strunell were over there and they've awesome bow hunters and uh you know getting to new countries is just what I love to do. Yeah, and the the non-native species thing is a fascinating thing to me because uh that's what we're dealing with in North America with uh, the wild hogs mm -hmm. that have been introduced, you know, they were introduced with the Europeans and they've run rampant all throughout I mean California, we were in uh Tahone Ranch oh, where right. I went uh hunting with Renella. And they have 50,000 hogs mm -hmm. on this one ranch. I mean, it's, they're fucking everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's insane. You yeah. see these herds of them. Oh, and they tear, They, I mean, they're rooting around, tearing up the ground. Yeah, and they breed all year round. Yeah. They're just constantly making babies. And so there's uh, there's certain ranches in uh, California, in Southern California, they're, they're begging people to come on their ranch mm -hmm. and kill hogs. You know, in Texas, famously, they, they're, they're shooting them out of helicopters. Yeah. 
I mean, they, they actually have companies that take people on helicopter hog hunts, mm -hmm. and that's what they're all about. They just fly around, they find the hogs, and they're shooting them out of the sky. Mm -hmm. And part of it is novelty, and in that, you know, you get to hunt from a helicopter, yeah. but part of it is necessity. Like, oh, yeah. You can't get to these damn things. You need to reduce the number somehow. Yeah. Not, the non-native species thing is very fascinating to me, and, you know, just the, the understanding of, of population control is one of the things that I've really become fascinated by with, by getting into hunting, understanding what the fish and wildlife, what they have to go through mm -hmm. in order to, to figure out like what, how many tags to give out, right. what, what the numbers are that they need to, uh, where they need to let animals recuperate, where mm -hmm. they need to, to, to go reduce. in and take some of them and reduce them. It's a, a fascinating thing, and one of the most efficient programs in our country, as far as, like, you want to talk about, like, government programs. Well, Fish and Wildlife is a government program, but, damn, it's effective. Yeah. Effective and efficient because it's run by actual hunters and fishermen and outdoorsmen. Yeah, no, and, and the thing about, you know, hunting, people still, if you're not a hunter, it's hard to understand, or some people still don't understand why in this day and age you need to hunt. Well, you know, like I, I work with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. They're the number one conservation group out there. And they've, they've helped protect habitat, I think, over 6 million acres now of habitat for elk. So that's from hunters, hunters' dollars, you know, conservation groups. So hunters, the money we pay for tag and license and, and everything else to use to be in, in out there hunting with the weapon, that's what goes into helping these animals. You know, elk numbers now have never been higher. That's, yeah, we're hunting them, but we're also paying and, and con, uh, contributing to the health and habitat and, and for elk and other wildlife. And that's, that's what people don't understand. Without putting a value on those animals, then that's where, I don't know, that's, that's where everything goes sideways. But because we value them, we're willing to pay money and help. And we got outfits like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation that just do amazing work for us. Yeah, I know what, where their mindset, I know, I understand where they're coming from, the people that are anti-hunting. Um, it's, they, they're coming from kindness. I mean, they don't want you to kill these cute animals. Mm -hmm. They don't want you, they, they, they feel like it's a cruelty thing mm -hmm. or that it's a, an evil thing to go out to nature and find these beautiful things and shoot them and kill them. I understand the mindset. Yeah. But it, like many things in life, is not nearly as cut and dry as everybody wants to, to paint it, as right. everybody wants to depict it. It's, it's a far more complex and complicated issue, and they have a hard time believing that someone could have a deep love for animals while still hunting them. Right. No, it's a, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody could respect a bull elk more than I do. You know, maybe the same, but it's, I think about elk hunting every single day and those bulls are, man, once, I don't know, I dreamed about killing a six by six bull elk or I, first of all, I didn't know if I had what it took. I was like, am I good enough or am I tough enough or can I even do this? I mean, maybe I can't, maybe I'm not even capable of it. Cause I, I could kill some animals. I could kill the spike bull. I killed some smaller bulls, but a six by six bull mature herd bull is what every hunter dreams of. And for folks who don't know what you're saying, six by six means six horns on, on, on their each antlers, side. six points on each side. Yeah. This is an enormous animal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for folks who don't understand, you're talking about antlers antlers that are bigger than my arms. Yeah. Longer and, and thicker even than my arms. Okay, so I killed a six by six bull this year in Colorado, or in 2013, and it was about 10 years old. So to do that, he's been through 10 hunting seasons. He's you know, endured 10 winters. It, I mean, tough, tough animal. And so for a long time, I didn't know if I had, if I had what it took. And that was the, that was, when I finally did do it is when Princess Di died, like I said. And so that was when I, when I called, it was just like, all I could think about is I finally proved to myself I could do it. And that's a, that's powerful. That was the first time that you'd ever done it. There, uh, there's one right there. Yeah. That's <sighs> more, that's more than the six by six. That's a, that's a, that's a monster. It looks like he's got an extra tie in there. But uh, pull no, up, pull up a video of elks bugling. I know well, we, we played one of those before, just so people can hear it. Because there's, there's one on my uh, on my YouTube from Colorado this year, and the bull's coming up the hill bugling, and it's so loud. Oh it's, yeah, okay. It's pull, what is that? What uh, what's the you know the name of the video? Um, should be something Colorado, um, Cam in Colorado or something like that. Well, Jamie will find it, but. 
the that animal itself, the the, the elk, is is almost like a mystical animal to yeah. me. Because if you've heard one, I've heard one call before, mm-hmm. and uh, we were in um, Mount Rainier. Mm-hmm. We, we actually weren't even hunting. We were looking for Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> I was there Let with my, get... my friend Duncan. You didn't find it, did Dude, you? Dude, we found them. I just like to keep secrets. Oh, I'm oh. not like Tom Sizemore. I'm not all blabby. <laughs> no, we, um, um, it, was, it was for this sci-fi show that I did called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. And uh, can you hear it? Yeah, oh. if you go to like, like eight or nine. Eight or nine minutes? Yeah. Let's see. Can we can we hear the? Oh yeah yeah yeah. Oh no, this is where I took a selfie of a bull coming in. No, it's past that. Maybe yeah, maybe right in there. Yeah, yeah. Turn. Can you can we? Oh, there we go. Listen to this. How far away is that right now? He's about seventy. That's him. That's so weird. Yeah, listen to this. And that's a carbon spider turbo. That's nope. an eighty pound. That's one? not a carbon. That's a spider turbo. That's before. The mm, that was last model time. before. <laughs> that is so amazing, crazy. dude. That will just put the hair on the back of your neck. Wow. And so you have this scope in your hand. That's a spotting scope that shows you the distance. Is it a distance? A <laughs> range finder. Range finder. Wow. Yeah. So he amazing. he's about eighteen yards right here, but he's going to get the wind. <laughs> So I have to try to stop. So I do that with my mouth. I'm trying to stop him before he smells me. So he spooks right here, and he goes to about 25, right here. My son Tanner's filming. Oh! Right there. So there's a perfect shot, and you'll see. Here's how you see how lethal a, a bow is. He's bleeding on the other side. Yeah, arrow went clear through. Wow. He probably doesn't even know what the fuck no. just happened. No, he's he's looking for a bull. He hears that other bull is bugling. He just got in a fight with a bull. Now he's like, he doesn't feel so good. Wow. So that's it. That's uh. That's an animal seven times bigger than you. Yeah, and that was just with a, a sharp stick, basically. And that's So that's what you dream of as a bow. Every bow hunter dreams of that. And how many of those have you ever killed? Oh, I don't know, probably 30. Wow, dude, you must have the most ridiculous freezer at home. Yeah, no, the freezer's full, definitely. Where, what kind of a freezer do you have? Do you have, like, one of them walk-in freezers? I have two, just two freezers. Two big, giant freezers? Yeah, in the garage. Yeah, and it's full of <laughs> bear and elk and everything else. You probably never have to go to the supermarket for meat, right? No, nah, we still like a good beef steak every once in a while. You know, I, I buy... Uh, I buy my um, beef from Adam LaRoche. He's uh, he he has a, a ranch in Kansas, and it's just you know the beef is raised, no steroids or no. It's just free range, and that's where I buy my meat from. He's uh, he's another hunter. He, it's on a show, Buck Commanders. He plays for the Washington Nationals. And is he, it uh, all grass fed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and it's as good as it gets. The farm that we hunted on in um, Wisconsin this year is my friend Doug, Doug Duran, and uh, he actually has cows on his farm as well and raises them grass-fed, gave us some of the beef. It was delicious. Amazing. Just, people don't realize, man, when you're feeding cows these these diets that are unnatural to them, giving them corn, they all all fat and shit. Like, I was at a restaurant the other day, and they tried to give me some of that Wagyu beef. They're like, it's our finest beef. I'm like, get that sloppy, <laughs> fat, stupid animal away from me. Oh, that drunken seen. animal. Yeah. No, it's, that's what it is. They they get them drunk off beer. They they're feeding them beer and fattening them up. Hmm. When you, you're not supposed to have all that fat, like in that marbling, no. you get a nice grass fed steak, and yeah. it's it's you know it's lean. It's very lean. And it's darker. Yeah. It's a deeper red. It's yeah. more like a game animal. Yeah, it's not as lean as elk. And no. Um. And but like you said, eating. Uh, is that Steve calling again? No. Sorry, I'm texting. <laughs> I should shut this fucking thing off. <laughs> um, Silly Steve. Yeah. How dare he? But I've been in Colorado on that high country there, and that's about 11,000 feet. That's up in the mountains. And I killed a bull, I don't know, I think it was three years ago. And we cut out the backstrap, built a fire, and cooked it. I actually put it on one of my arrows, because my arrows are aluminum, and cooked the backstrap, uh, skewered on an arrow over a fire. And I don't care where I've eaten or the food I've eaten, it would never be better than that right there in the mountains killing or eating an animal I just killed. It was amazing. Yeah, we did that in Montana. We had uh, liver and uh, we ate liver and heart. 
that we had killed the two hours ago, mm. and we uh, we cooked it up at the campfire, and we were all just like, oh, this is incredible. It's so good. Yeah. And the, the, the taste, it right it's so vibrant, too. Like, the, the taste of elk, elk is an extremely delicious animal. It's uh, It's got a really unique flavor to it. Yeah. Almost sweet, right? Well, and it's just, you know, so I was, I was cutting that back strap on a rock, dirty hands, just a knife that I'd gutted it with. It's just like, so wh- whatever. Um, I don't even know how you'd describe it, but it's just, I don't know, it just feels like that's, that's how it's meant to be. That's almost how <laughs> I've, it feels like I'm meant to live. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just out there living in the, in the mountains. And I don't know, just powerful. Even not killing an animal, there's something to me about the mountains that's insanely appealing. Um, I, I just, I love being in the mountains. There's, it gives you this weird, I, I've, it sounds like very hippie. But I believe that when you are in these areas, like when you are in a mountain and there's all these trees and there's a river or stream or whatever, I feel like there's energy coming out of those trees mm-hmm. and there's energy in that hill. And then these, these life forms, these, these plants that grow there in the wild and they're these vibrant things that have existed without any human assistance whatsoever and will be here probably long after we're gone. Mm-hmm. There's, there's something to them where when you're in that environment, you feel it. You might not even know you feel it, but sort of like you don't know when you're breathing smoggy air. You're just mm-hmm. breathing smoggy air. Yeah. And then you get to a mountain, you get that mountain air and you're like, wow, this is different. And then you're around those those plants. I feel like, I mean, it's not like they're communicating with you, but I feel like they give off a vibe. Yeah. I, that wasn't after you smoked a bunch of pot, was it? I ate a bunch of pot. <laughs> a bunch of pot. No, it was even stone cold sober, man. But <laughs> yeah, that the pot would definitely enhance. No, I I believe that too. You know, I've I've been, there's this place I used to go and camp by myself in the Eagle Cap, and it was just like on this rock shelf looking over this huge canyon and uh, so I was I was sleeping there one night, and uh, you know stars are out. And just before dark, I'd glassed about 300 yards away a bunch of bighorn rams. And you know sheep are just like the holy grail of hunting, right? And so I was watching these sheep, and it's just like it's just so I don't know, it's so amazing that moment. So I went to bed uh, in my bivy sack there, and I woke up in the morning. The sheep were still there, except there was one less. And I'm like, I wonder where the heck that other ram went. Well, I went over there and and found a lion had killed a ram the night before. And so I found his leg. I'm like, oh, okay, well, here's one reason why he wasn't with them. But it's just like those those rams are there feeding. Uh, one got killed by a lion. They're still there feeding. Nothing had changed. I mean, the wind was still blowing. The They were still feeding, but one was gone. And it just... To me, it's just like, man, he, I could die back here. Nothing, nothing changes. I mean, you are just, you really figure out how you fit in. Nobody, nothing cares back there. It's just like, that's just the way it goes. There's life and death and nothing in the wilderness changes. And that just, to me, that was powerful. You know, you feel, you really feel um, how you fit in. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's humility. You don't, you don't have much of an impact, really. You know who needs to feel that? Who's that? Kanye West. <laughs> you need to take that motherfucker bow hunting. There you go. Take him bow hunting, and why he's in his little tent, and he hears, <laughs> Yeah. Here's some mountain goat get taken out. Well, I think a lot of people could benefit, including Kanye. Almost everybody could benefit. <laughs> but have, have you ever had any encounters with mountain lions? Um, let's see. I've had a shot at one. I've never killed one. I've never been with dogs, you know, hunting lions. Mm. So it's just kind of been on a happen chance. But um, I was still in that same country, and I was walking on the top of this cliff, and I was looking down at the Rocky Mountain, the goats. I don't know, have you ever seen a goat? It's a white with the little black horns. Mm-hmm. Well, they live up in notoriously steep country. So I'm up on top of this cliff looking down at the goats, and I was just by myself sneaking along. And I look up further down the down the cliff and there's a lion standing there watching the same goats so i was a hunt i didn't have a tag for the goats, so i was just kind of watching them they only give one tag for that area it's really really tough to get but still they're just awesome animals and um so i looked down and there's a lion watching the same goats and you could see they if those goats get too high 
they get killed by the lion. So they kind of stay a little lower. It doesn't, they, they figure it out, but that lion's just waiting for one to make a mistake. Well, I was just seconds from being able to get a shot because I had a lion tag, mountain lion, and uh, you, you guys can't hunt them here, but we can hunt them in, in Oregon, but not, not with dogs. But uh, I was seconds from getting a shot, and right before he looked at me and uh, took off. So I've seen that lion. Um, I've uh, I saw a lion chasing a cow elk back there. They're they're uh, nocturnal. You just don't see many lions out in daylight unless they're hunting like that. But um, I've seen them. Do you hear them like when you're camping? Um, yeah, they may. Yeah, you you know I may not have known what it was, but. Uh, they do make a, a noise unlike any you've ever heard, you know, and that's lions. And it can like, just. What does it sound like? I don't know. It'd be hard to describe. But, Give uh, it a shot. No, I can't. I can't, can't do it. Can't do a lion impression? No, I can't do it. Is it. No, nah, no? no, not like that. No. Deeper? It, yeah. It's a. Uh, no, that's no? more like a bear. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But, you but know. Something creepy. Yeah, something. Cre- you're right, exactly. Something that you were like, that's weird have you ever seen the photo of the uh the lion and the ram dead on the road where mm-hmm. they had fallen off the cliff yeah where the the lion and the ram were duking it out yeah and uh apparently they they both went over the edge yeah that to me is one of the most powerful photographs of the struggle of nature the the tooth fang and claw of the wilderness yeah. and that happens all the time you I'm just sure. you just don't have pictures of it yeah because you know, it's not on a road right but uh yeah that's they deal with that all the time. Both of them deal mm-hmm. with that all the time. Yeah, and you know it is what it is. Yeah, nothing, See, nothing you can changes. Find that picture, Jamie. That's a crazy picture. Yeah, this is the picture. Yeah, the series of them, the two of them lying down on the road. I mean, that is such a powerful photograph. Yeah, it just makes you realize like what an insane struggle it is to try to be surviving. As an animal in the oh, wilderness. Yeah. And see, look, that's all snow piled up there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's cold. It's, I mean, they're out there 365 days a year trying to survive. So that's why I think about, I, I think about what they go through when I'm working out. And it's just like, they're so much tougher. I mean, we're such, so weak as a society. You know, we're used to laying on the couch, watching TV, having everything. Well, a bull elk is laying out there in the rain and the snow and the whatever, getting so tough. And so I always think about there's this gap between me and and a bull. I need to close that gap because it's just getting wider and wider every day for most. You know, so if you can close that, if I can get tougher and tougher and tougher, I'm going to be more on an equal playing field and be more of a predator like a lion, you know what I mean, or a wolf. How did you decide to specialize in elk? Um, is it just the biggest animal near you in Oregon? Yeah, it's just like, you know, it was probably the most respected and regal animal that I could afford to hunt. You know, I didn't, for when I first started hunting, we bought a, a deer tag. It was like 1150 I couldn't even afford an elk tag because they were 25 bucks. It was like $25. There's no way I'm ever going to hunt elk. And, uh, so that's just the way it was. Didn't have any money. And then once I could afford elk, um, it was that year that, uh, that I killed that one with the bow. And, um, you know, so I'm in at like 30 bucks. I'm like, I need to get my money's worth out of this thing between, uh, you know, I think it went up a little bit. So it was 27, 50 or something like that. But, um, yeah, that was it. There's just, it was just the biggest, most respected animal. A bull elk is just like, Man, you know, I, I could never dream of hunting sheep at that time or um, buffalo or whatever. So it was elk. And elk, I mean, if you got 500 pounds of meat off an animal, what is that worth money-wise? I mean, that what a bargain for a $25 tag. You get 500 pounds. Well, obviously, you have to pay for your equipment and your time and your yeah, food it, and everything it, to it, get it out It there. doesn't pencil out. Doesn't pencil <laughs> no, out, no. Once you, once you figure out the time and, you know, you look at these bows right here, these are... You know, shoot, by the time you get this bow set up here with arrows and everything else, it's like 2000 bucks. So you don't want to pencil it out that. It's not It's not about the, the value of it. You know what I mean? So uh, it's just about more about just the experience. And why did you decide to go to Australia to shoot these uh, water buffaloes? Just for the experience of it? Yeah, just um, I wanted it. you know, it's like when I'm not hunting, 
I don't know, just being in my office working at my regular work, I feel like I'm dying, basically. Do you really? Yeah, I just feel like, what? Your boss is listening right now. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> It's He's like, what the fuck, Cam? I okay. thought you like it here. <laughs> no, I, I do like we it. We like you in the office. You're yeah. dying? Yeah. Well, you, I mean, I like it there. <laughs> Damage control. Sorry, boss. <laughs> hey, listen, man. I felt like I was dying when I was doing Fear Factor. I know what you're talking about. No, but I just feel like that's not what I'm... What you want to do. ...meant to do. Yeah. It's just, I just need, I need, uh, I need to be outside. I need to be, you know, challenged. And so I'm like, well, God, what can I do? And so came out um it was in december just you know recently and i'm like i want to go do something i've never done so hoyt hooked me up with adam down there in australia and i wanted to do actually when i first um decided to go there it was it was just going to be to give away a bow what i do with the bows after i get done shooting them for the year is i hold these contests and it's like win cam's bow and i just say um if you want to win my bow from last year show up at this time and beat me at any challenge, beat me at the challenges I put out there and you can have my bow. And so I was just gonna do a win a bow in Australia because I have so many people that order my shirts and hats and and everything else from down there. I'm like, I need to get down there and see these people. You know, I just wanted to, I just felt so much support down there. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so I asked Hoyt, I said, I wanna do a win a bow down and down there, can you help me set it up, you know, with the pro shops or the archery shops down there? So it just kind of turned into a hunt at the same time. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do a hunt also. So that was what I did the hunt. Then I did the win cams bow contest and it's just tied it all together. And what was the the contest? What did they have to do to win your bow? Um, they had to beat me at running. Uh, well, so we ran, then we did push ups, then we did pull ups, and then we did a hundred yard shot. So if you beat me at those, you get my bow. All three? They have to beat you at all of them? Four. Four. Yeah. All four of them? Yeah. And then if nobody... So if, what if they only beat you at three of them? No, then I... Like then I pound then, sand, next. No, then I get to choose who I give it to. Uh, so I give it away either way. Right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not like, uh, you guys suck. I'm taking my bow home. <laughs> no, I just... Then I get... To, so the thing is, I'm going to give it away to somebody. If somebody beats me at all that, it's no questions, it's your bow. And if nobody does, I choose out of the contestants. And so I ended up giving it to this uh, 13-year-old girl there. And um, I just liked her heart. You know, it was 100 degrees and like 100% humidity. It was just brutal. And uh, we were running. We ran 12 laps around this, uh, like, a, I think it was a cricket field. But it's about, you know, a 5K, like 3.1 miles. And so we were running, and uh, nobody beat me at that. But she was just out there grinding and sweating and hot and just showing a lot of heart. Then she did the pull-ups and, of course, didn't win the pull-ups. And she did push-ups. And then at the 100-yard shot, she made an awesome shot. I mean, she wasn't the closest, but made a good shot at 100 yards at this 3D bull elk. And, uh, you know, there's other people who beat her there, but I didn't think anybody showed as much heart as she did. So I gave her the bow. And, you know, it was an 80-pound bow, so obviously... I don't know. If she, I told her, I said, you don't need to keep it. You can sell it and buy clothes. You can do whatever you want with it. The point is, is your effort to me won this bow today. That's and, cool, man. And it's, and it's up to you. That's really cool. Now, when you um, went out there uh, hunting the water buffalo, you camped out there. You camped out there in the bush? Yeah, there was, there was actually, uh, we stayed in this village from the Aborigines. They were, we thought they were going to be there, but there's actually nobody there. And um, we had... To hunt, it's called a traditional land, native land. You have to get permission from the Aborigines to hunt it. And w what I was told is probably only 50 white men had ever been there just because it's, it's wild country. It's just where they live. But nobody's in the village, and we don't know why it was abandoned or whatever. We, you know, some, I guess if an elder dies, they will leave. They think there's bad spirits in the village. So they just leave everything and take off. So we don't know for sure why it was empty, but we were just there by ourselves. And we just basically slept on the porch of this hut out there. And uh, we didn't, Adam, who I, who I was, went out there with, he was like, you know, when we, we took a helicopter out there, the only way to get there was a four hour helicopter ride. And uh, I said, do we want to get any food? He's like, he goes, I think it'd be better if we just lived off the land. And I'm like, Okay, that's yeah, that's cool. I didn't know what was out there for sure. Turns out there's not much. <laughs> and so that was, 
that was not the best idea to try to live off the land. Luckily, an, another guy, uh, Owen, went, and he did bring some food, but still we didn't have hardly have any food. I mean, I had a granola bar, and I had some trail mix from the airport, and uh, Adam had a granola bar, and then Owen, he brought some apples and oranges and stuff like that, but all that stuff was gone fast, and we were out there five full days. It was 120 degrees Fahrenheit out there, and the water was like it looked like this coffee i mean because bu- <laughs> the buffalo lived in it and they just piss and shit oh man. yeah just <laughs> non-stop so you know we would we would have to treat that water oh you drank that water there's nothing else oh yeah my goodness yeah so it was a process we, what does buffalo piss taste like exactly it's you know surprisingly it's not that good <laughs> 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 now, do you put it through filters? Do you do you boil it? Like, we here's what we did. First, we poured it through our shirt, okay, to try to get the big chunks out. Right. Like, I, Owen brought back some water one time, and he's like, "What does this smell like?" And I was just like, "Oh my god, <laughs> smells like buffalo you, piss." And you knew you're gonna have to drink. Yeah. That. So we poured it through the shirt. And then we did it through a pump. Adam had a pump, and then he had a stereo pin. What which, kind of pump? What do you um, need a pump. A water, you know, it's, it's for filtering water. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what kind it was. But it it filters through, like, a pump system? Yeah. you Like you, a carbon? Right, yeah. It's a filter that supposedly cleans the water. So, and then we had a SteriPen, which is a UV light that also cleans the water. And so we had the shirt, the filter, the SteriPen. And then he's like, okay, so we got all that. Now what does it smell like? And it's in, a, like, a, a cup like this. And I was like... Oh my, it still smells, it <laughs> d- smelled no different. So we drank that. Oh my God, like that? Looks Just like that. Like it was. No yeah. boiling it, nothing? Mm-mm. Oh my God, she drank straight buffalo piss. Yeah. Uh, and shit too, right? Yeah. What about the, the bacteria and, you know, like the, that stuff that you get like when you drink uh, stream water? What's that called? It's real common. Oh, Giardia? Yeah, Giardia. What yeah, about that? Well, that's what that stuff was supposed to kill or take out. Wow. Yeah, so Adam, he was he was like took a drink of it and he was kind of went into convulsions a little bit. He's like <laughs> he's like my body's rejecting it and uh it was just nasty. Oh. But it, and then then there was another time so we we found this uh we found some hamburger patties that were from the natives there. They had the freezer. Actually the, the government or whoever it is comes in there and they put power and and water their solar power cuz it's so, you know, it's hot and sunny down there. So um uh, there was a freezer and it had some hamburger, hamburger patties. So we stole those and we're cooking those up. So we're down to like one last patty and I had it, I took it cause I had no food and I had it in my trail mix ba- bag cause I had no more trail mix. So I had it in there and I had one cooked hamburger patty. And I remember we were sitting there and we just drank a, a big old vat of Buffalo piss water. And I'm like, man, you know what would go good with this is that hamburger patty. So I ends up my backpack and I pull out my trail mix with the hamburger bag with the hamburger patty in it and it's just solid ants i mean ants are all filled up and it's just not like regular little cool black ants like we have here it's just red mean whatever ants and just all over in my backpack all over that patty but so all i did i just blew off uh, scraped them off blew them off the hamburger patty and ate it why don't you just eat the ants too <laughs> we should have yeah I sh- if they get totally gangster <laughs> i mean you drink it buffalo piss I might know. as well eat some ants but but you know here's the thing is you know experiences like that is that's where you appreciate you know i don't know how good we have it mm-hmm. because you you realize all of, all that matters is you have something to drink and something to eat that's it. Yeah, you have to keep your body alive, and there's no other way to no. do it. No, and so you get home, and you see people complain about, oh, there's no ice for this water. I got to drink this warm water. I'm like, that water looks pretty damn good. <laughs> I mean, I've drank some nasty water, and I'd take that, you know. So it just puts everything in perspective, you know. And you have to make sure that you're not getting dehydrated, too. So you have to yeah. drink a lot of that piss water. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Oh, it what was... kind of rocket diarrhea did you guys develop? <laughs> No. I just, I need to know because no. it must have been like some broken fire hydrant <laughs> type diarrhea. Mm-mm. No, Mm-mm. you didn't? No. I, wow. I must not have, I mean, we must have got it pretty clean. You must have a strong constitution. I guess so. Now, the buffalo itself, you said that you guys ate that buffalo. Yeah, we had nothing else to eat. And well, you were telling me about this before the podcast started, but for the folks at home, uh, what was that like? Yeah, it was. Uh, so the back strap is typically the best cut of any game animal. It's right along the spine, and there's no bones, and it's just big, solid 
meat. And it's usually just like on an elk, that's like as good as it gets. Tenderloin. Yeah. And so um, we cut that off and we cooked that up. And these buffalo, so cut that up and, and cooked it up. So I'd take a bite and I'd shoot my bow just in the middle of the day. And uh, I was shooting for probably maybe a half hour, came back, still chewing the same bite. And so the thing about these buffalo, because there's no predators, and we were trying to kill the, the biggest bulls out there. Um, the bull could be 30 years old. Anything, any animal that old in those conditions, the muscles are going to be, so it's muscle you're eating. The muscles are going to be, you know, whatever, just not very pliable. And dense. so, yeah, dense. And so I chewed that one bite of the premium cut for half hours, like, you know, eating a shoe. So that was it. What about the organs? Did you eat the liver? No. How come? No, I never, yeah. You don't like liver? No. You don't like liver like from a deer? No. Really? No. Why? I don't know. Man, that's my favorite part. That just filters all the crap. It's so good for you though. No. It does not. a good job of filtering the crap. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a liver guy. That's interesting. Mm. You know, the, the alpha wolf is the one that gets the liver mm. when they take out an animal. Oh, you might really? Want to reconsider. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the alpha wolf, they battle over who gets the liver. And the, that's how they determine the alpha status of the pack, is that the, the wolf, who's the baddest motherfucker, mm -hmm. is the one that eats the liver. Mm. There was a uh, documentary on uh, this guy who lived with wolves. There was, an, uh, in, um, there was a uh, contained area. Uh, I, I forget where it was, I forget what part of the world, but this one guy lived with these wolves in this contained area, and he was the alpha. And the way that he became the alpha is he was with these wolves since they were little, mm -hmm. and he would always eat liver in front mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. So he would uh, have an animal that they would give to these wolves, and he would put a liver inside of this animal, and he would like open up the Ziploc bag and pull mm -hmm. this liver out and eat it in front of them. So they knew that because he was eating the, the, the liver, he yeah. was the alpha. Yeah. Well, he went away because he had to deal with... Um, there was a local farmer that had a, a wolf invasion. Mm. And the wolf were killing his livestock. So this guy uh, had to assist this farmer. And one of the ways he assisted him, he set up all these speakers where he had uh, howls. Like he set up like as if there was like a, a new pack yeah. that it in, encroached into this area. And he uh, set up this whole elaborate thing to try to ward off these wolves without having to kill them. And then, you know, some time went by, several weeks, and he went back to the, uh, the the wolves and a new alpha was there. Yeah. So he had to beg for his life in front of this new alpha. He had a whimper and he had a like, oh, really? yeah, it was really intense because wow. it was baring its teeth. It was challenging him for the mm -hmm. alpha position. Yeah. And so he had to get out of it by being a bitch because mm. normally wolves will duke it out and find out, well, oh, oh, you're the alpha now. Well, let's yeah. see what's up, bitch. And you know they would duke it out to see who this wolf was determined to eat that liver. Mm -hmm. So he had to like, they, he, had a fight for his position in yeah. the pack by begging, well, begging that's, for his life. I like I, that's what I do like how simple life is in the mountains. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one leader. There's it's just that's the you know that when I was young, I liked being back there because I didn't have to worry about you know whether somebody liked me or mm -hmm. whether I had money or whether any help from anybody it was just like so simple and so cut and dry just like that there's one alpha wolf and mm -hmm. i mean either are you tougher or is he tougher you know what i mean and that's i just like the how black and white the mountains are you know if you're not tough you die yeah that's that's great if you're tough <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah if you're not tough you want to get back home to the internet I'm like fuck this place man <laughs> i need air conditioning i need yeah. a blanket I, I did, you know, I did a commercial with the wolf for Under Armour this, oh, I don't know, we filmed it last year, but uh, I thought the the best ending to that commercial would have been if I could have killed that wolf, because it's just like, how, how it went is me and the wolf were running through the woods, we're both doing the same things, and um, and then the commercial ended with me, I had a, a bull elk I had killed, but we just took the rack up there but i had it on my pack and the wolf came up and he saw me with that bull elk and it's like i won because we we're both hunting the mm -hmm. elk but i i got it and so the wolf jumped up on this log and he snarled and was not happy and i thought i said man this the best ending to this would be if i just arrowed that wolf too because <laughs> <laughs> you got to kind of infer that i won but right man that would that would sell tell the story right there well that that would really like send it home for our under armor though people would boycott they would stop yeah. he's killing wolves <laughs> yeah.
I is know. this the commercial? Play uh, it. Yeah, that's it. Let's hear the volume. With preparation and the right gear, you can become nature's equal. That's even better. You're like, bitch, I already won. Yeah. That doesn't look like a real wolf, though. That's a real wolf. Don't belong. It looks like one of those bitch ass trained wolves. Yeah. Oh, that was a trained wolf, but it was <laughs> an actual real trained wolf. A real wolf, not like a hybrid wolf. No, no, no. No, that was, and that, that wolf actually, so it was, that wolf had been in like the Twilight movies. You know, I mean, it's, it's sort of a famous wolf. But uh, um, the thing about it is to make it snarl like that, I took some elk steak up there. And uh, I was gonna give it, I was gonna give it some elk after it did this whole thing. But to make it mad like that, you had to give it meat and take it away. Give it meat, take it away. Whoa! And they said, they said, okay, yeah, we. The trainer said, okay, we can make it mad and snarl like you need for the commercial, but uh, once we do that, it, we're we're done because it's gonna be pissed off for the whole rest of the day. So that Ooh. was the last thing. So those, that wolf had been. Um, I think they had it since it was five weeks old and it was 11 years old, but it's still crazy. Yeah, it's I a mean, real you, wolf. Yeah, I mean, you don't, they have that in them. So it was, pretty, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I had a friend who had uh, hybrids. They weren't even full wolves. They were like, you know, seven-eighths wolf or something mm -hmm. like that. But he had them uh, and they got away from him. They, got, they were in his, uh, his yard and they went over to the neighbor's property and killed like something like 18 sheep or something like that yeah, just yeah. went on a, a just an orgy of murder yeah and just slaughtered this guy's sheep yeah you know and then uh you know the, the rancher comes over pissed at him and he tried to deny it gives his wolves a <laughs> bath and i'm like come on yeah. man what the fuck else is gonna kill 18 of them a mountain yeah. lion's gonna kill one and yeah. eat it no uh, it's it's a well-fed wolf dog that's gonna go on this mad orgy of murder yeah i've read a lot you know i've always been a fan of wolves which is kind of cool to do that commercial with the wolf but you know I, I read you know call of the wild when i was a kid and white fang all that but um um that they i've read a lot about wolves and they're the, one of the only animals that'll do thrill killing you know yeah. just kill a bunch of things just to kill them yeah you know whereas other animals usually kill just what they eat yeah they um had a problem with that recently at this uh ranch in montana um where these uh this pack of wolves just got a hold of these calves and mm -hmm. just slaughtered a bunch of calves like you know a ton of them like you know 12 calves mm -hmm. and just left them i mean ate part of them but yeah. left a lot of them just sitting there dead frozen and it's it was a really creepy scene it was mm -hmm. on a, a television show that i was watching and when they're you know these calves that are mostly covered in snow you see their bodies and you really see this the havoc that these things they're they're too close to people yeah. these fucking wolves you know yeah no. they're, they're creepy in a weird way they're smart they're sneaky they're strategic in how they kill things yeah and then they do this thrill killing thing yeah no it's i mean and you can't blame a wolf that's just how they are but we don't need a bunch of them running around the mountains. I mean, yeah, but people have a, a weird relationship with them because they look so much like dogs. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's a strange sort of a, a relationship that people who love wildlife have that they would be cured of really fucking quickly if they were out there in the woods and they saw a pack of wolves. Yeah, because they would realize, oh, these are monsters. Yeah. These no. these are the things that they made Little Red Riding Hood about. This mm -hmm. is this is the big bad wolf. Yeah, like there's a reason why all of those children's stories involved evil wolves because wolves eat kids. Yeah, on a regular basis back then. Well, it's people. They're, they're just not realistic about it. I mean, a wolf that they're, they're just looking for something to kill. Yeah, whether, whether it's, it's your baby, you, yeah, you, a deer, yeah, you know, and people. You know, just like that Timothy Treadwell up in Alaska when he was living with the bears and he thought, oh, bears are my friends, you know. this. Hello, oh. Mr. Chocolate. Yeah. How they, are you? They ate him and his girlfriend. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> they're not your friends. Not even slightly. <laughs> no. They, 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 the only reason why they aren't eating you is because they don't eat you every day, so they're not used to seeing you as food. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. And with wolves, they're like, this motherfucker might have a bang stick. They like circle you, look at him. What's that thing in his hand? Hmm. Yeah, I might go bang. Yeah, you know if they've heard the bang stick a few times, then they go running. Yeah, I uh, I'm not a big fan of wolves. I am a big fan of wolves, and I'm not a big fan of wolves. Like mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a big fan as far as them. Like just like I'm a big fan of lions. I think even mountain lions. I think they're fascinating. Just wild animals, and wild predators are absolutely. They're they're enchanting in mm -hmm. a way. Just this idea that this thing exists along with us. 
with our lattes and our electric cars and our Wi-Fi, along at the same time, at this very same moment we're doing this podcast, there's some gangster-ass mountain lion in Arizona right now getting shit done yeah. on a mountain. Yeah. Sneaking up on some ram or whatever the fuck mm-hmm. he can get his teeth onto. And that's yeah. what he does every day. And there's thousands of them. Yeah. It's not just one. There's a whole community of mountain lions, and they're, that's what they do. Yeah. Whether it's the wolves in Idaho that are destroying the elk or the mountain. They're, they're really, really fascinating. But people who are anti-hunting need to understand that just because a lot of people don't like to eat mountain lion or because nobody eats wolves – you still need to kill those things, mm-hmm. like, and it's important because if if it doesn't happen, mm-hmm. they're gonna creep into civilian areas the same way they used to back in the day when they were writing those little Red Riding Hood books. Yeah, I've told this story in the podcast before, but I'll tell it again. In Paris in the 1400s, wolves killed 40 people in Paris. Mm-hmm. Like they had a corner wolves in the streets of Paris and and killed them with spears and sticks and rocks. Yeah. Like they're not to be fucked with. This no. is this is not. They're not your dogs. No. It's, it's not a, a beautiful animal that you know has a relationship. With. I mean, even the way we treat like killer whales. Killer whales don't kill people in the wild. They actually help people that fall out of boats. Mm-hmm. You know, the killer whales might be your friends. We should probably be way nicer to killer whales <laughs> than we are to wolves. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, there's something about hunting a predator you know i mean i've done a lot of bear hunts and i was up in alberta this year and i you know a lot of people bear hunt and they'll they'll like sit up in a tree stand this and that i'm like i said i want i want to hunt i want to hunt a predator and they're seven foot black bear they're huge but i want to be on the ground i was up there with john rivet in uh in alberta i said i want to be on the ground living amongst them and there's something about and so we did that this is you here what Um, are you cooking here Oh, that call that bear crack. Yeah, so you bait them up there. And um, there's so many bear up there. You can kill two bears. There's just like tons of bear. You need to manage that number. But uh, so that bear, we call it bear crack because once they get hooked on the crack, you, they're, they're, I mean, they're coming in. And what is bear crack? What, what do you, what's in, the, what do you, what do you oh, mix it in there? Marshmallows and jello and stuff like that. Just something that smells good. But, but those bears get. Can you cook it? Yeah, just kind of get it wafting in the in the air, and then uh-huh. and then the smoke goes off through there. But uh, um, I wanted to, I wanted like that bear was probably, God, what was that? Like maybe twelve feet. Yeah, away. pull pull that video up again, Jamie. Look how close this fucking bear is. <laughs> that's a big bear too, man. Yeah, that's a good bear. And we should point out probably that black bear are much less likely to attack a person than a grizzly. Yeah, that I mean. They'll, but the thing is with the wild animal, they'll do whatever they want. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can say. They don't follow the books. No. I mean, you might get attacked and you go, hey, you're less likely to do that. (laughs) You know, it doesn't matter. So you never know a bear, uh, a bear comes and um, they may, any animal will make a decision right then on what they want to do. You know, if it's a predator, if it's a, a dominant predator, dominant bear are, more likely just to come walking right in like that and just say, you better leave because I'm coming in. And those, those are the ones, I mean, those are the ones I go after. I want the, the dominant animal. And, uh, and that one, um, that one wasn't like one of the giant, that was a big bear, but not one of the giant bear, but there's something about being on the ground eye to eye with a, a predator like that. That's, uh, I mean, that's just what I like to do. So you passed on that bear because it was too yeah. small? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big bear. Yeah, that was. But it wasn't seven foot, 400 pounds, like what? the ones that I got. Well, how big was that one, you think? That was like s- probably six foot, maybe you know 250 or 275. Wow. Now, why do you want the dominant ones? Um, they're the, you know, they're the older. Sometimes those old boars don't breed as much as they used to. Um, a lot of the old boars, you know, especially a dominant boar will kill other bear. So even if it's it's an own cub, I mean, it breeds a lot of sows, you know, when they're in their prime. So the sows have cubs, a dominant boar will kill the cubs because he's trying to eliminate competition for him, Mm -hmm. you know, so he'll kill his own cubs. That's just how it works. And they eat them too, right? Yeah, they can, they eat them. I mean, I've, I had this, we were, um, on Prince of Wales Island, one, that's where this video is right here. Prince of Wales Island one time, 
or no, no, that's, this is Alaska. This isn't Prince of Wales, but, uh, this guy hit this bear and we came right at dark. We came back the next day to recover it. And the dominant boar had eaten his bear. Whoa. That's just, they are just, I don't know. It's wow. just survival of the fittest basically. So those, so you want, we take those dominant boars out of there and it pretty much helps the health of the, of the herd basically, mm -hmm. or not, not the, herd, but the numbers bears aren't herd, but what, whatever the, how many bears are there, it, it'll, it'll help, you know, taking that big, nasty, dominant one out of there. And then that's, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just don't need to kill just to kill, you know, I've killed, you know, when I first started, I, I killed anything I'd have a chance at. I just wanted to notch that tag, take meat home to my family and have success. Now, I mean, like I hunted back home for deer in Oregon and I didn't kill, I passed up everything. Cause I never saw the animal that I wanted to kill. I never saw the, a, the, a mature buck, one that I wanted to get. So I just didn't kill. I mean, I don't need to kill. I, if, if I'm going to, it's going to be something that, you know, I'm really, uh, I don't know, infatuated with, or just sold on that. I, I really want that. So it was just a matter of you just, did, did you see good deer? You just didn't see a great one? Yeah. Yeah. So good bucks, probably most people would kill them, but I just didn't see the one I wanted. What were you looking for? How big? Um, like a big, you know, four by four, um, you know, kind of like, you know, like what you got there, mule uh, deer? that mule, but this is blacktail. Blacktail. Yeah. This is in Western Oregon. So a, a good four by four blacktail, you know, five years old, good mature buck. And I just never had a chance at one. So I didn't, didn't kill anything. Now these bear that you're killing in, uh, Alberta, is that where it was? Or mm -hmm. Prince Alaska? Is that where was it? Prince of Wales? Uh, this last one, like we showed that clip, um, that was, uh, Alberta. Alberta. Mm -hmm. Are you eating these bears? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I eat everything I kill. What does it taste like when you eat this big old bear? Chicken. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Bear, you know, bear, I've had really good bear. And it used to be, so, like, if you have a bear that's living on berries and you get up there in the mountains, you kill it, it's going to be really sweet meat because it's eating blueberries or whatever else. If you have a bear that's coming into bait, and pin, like some people bait down here just with meat scraps or whatever, might have maggots. It's probably not going to be that good, you know. But those bear in Alberta, mostly we're, there's uh, just grain is what we're putting out there. Little bear cracks. So those bear are really good. Um, I don't know what it tastes like. It's more like it's fatter meat, maybe more like pork, but uh, it's good. What are they eating for the most part? Like what's their diet consist of? Mm. in alberta man whatever they can get a hold of yeah a lot Vegetation. of grass a lot yeah. of grass yeah yeah I it depends on the time of the year so but they'll take they'll take some oats over grass any day yeah i watched this episode of uh, meat eater with uh, steve ranella where he uh went for these um fall bears that were fattening up mm -hmm. before uh they would hibernate and they were eating berries they were eating blueberries yeah. And he, it was incredible because as he was cutting this bear open, like you see the fat is actually blue. Yeah. It's got like a blue tint to it from all the berries that right. this animal had been eating. Right. And he said it was just unbelievably good. Good. Yeah, I know. And that's, you know, you get those huge black bears or if they're eating fish, like in Alaska, if they're down where, like on Prince Wells, they can eat a lot of fish that come in. And those bears are huge because of all that protein. Mm -hmm. I mean- just it's all about, about their diet and they get giant because they're eating solid protein all the time but those bears aren't as good um from fish for whatever reason they taste fishy uh, i don't know about fishy just not as sweet yeah because i've heard like diver ducks diver like there's two types of ducks for folks who don't know there's ducks that eat vegetation and there's diver ducks that go under the water and eat fish mm -hmm. and those kind of taste like shit yeah yeah no it's, it's probably the you know, it's probably the same with anything. You are what you eat. Yeah, exactly. So if you're going to eat a person, make sure it's a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, Steve Ranella with uh, this blueberry fat bear. Yeah. This fat is just like a berry. It's almost half liquid at room temp. But if you read old accounts from like pioneering Alaskans, I mean, not even that long ago, even back in the 1950s, everybody... <laughs> would want to kill a big fat bear and fall like this on berries. Yeah. Cause they didn't have butter and oil and they would kill these bears. Take the fat. Just to lay by a winter's worth of butter and oil. Wow. <clears throat> I shouldn't call it butter, but you know, 
something to substitute as butter. You can just spread the fat. Once you cook it, you can spread the fat. You know, the other thing that's uh, unfortunate is everybody can't do that because there's just literally not enough game for everybody. If the entire country went hunting. Yeah, they're not going to. Either. It's like I said, when I talk, started writing about my hunts in the mountains, even people that thought they wanted to do it didn't want to do it. <laughs> I mean, you, yeah, not everybody wants to do that. Yeah, the it's hard work, man. It's hard work. I I enjoyed it very very much, but uh, I'm not I'm not scared to work hard, and I I like new experiences. So for me, it was uh, it was very exciting and invigorating. But I could see someone who's a bitch who uh, couldn't handle it. Oh yeah, no, there's nothing easy <laughs> nothing easy about carrying all your gear, all your survival gear, trying to get an animal. I mean, it. Sometimes I've been on hunts even now that are so tough. I'm I wondered. How have I ever killed anything with a bow? It just seems impossible to get in bow range and make a good shot and then recover the animal. And it's just it, um, it's so tough. Ronello was telling me about this moose <clears throat> that uh, they shot where uh, he had to carry it. They did nothing but go out to this moose, cut it up, and carry it back for three days because mm -hmm. it was like a nine mile trip. Yeah. So they would go to camp, they would get up in the morning. Go hike out to where the moose was, mm -hmm. take pieces of the moose, put it in their packs, and then walk back. And they did it for three days in a row. And he said he wasn't right for two weeks. Yeah. He said his body was just broken down. Yeah. No, that's, uh, you know, you earn everything you get out of the mountains. They'll get, they'll get it out of you one way or another. Most people are just not going to experience that. It's unfortunate. But when you do do it, the people that do do it, they kind of, one of the th thrills of it is that most people are not going to experience that. No, but I think you should be able to respect it. You know, that's the thing. So it's not saying you need to do it, but, man, it's not too much to ask to respect what it takes. Do you uh, find that people disrespect it? Well, I just think that they, they minimize. They're just thinking like, oh, you know, do you think you're a big man from going out and killing? You know, I get anti-hunters who post on my some of my videos or, you know, from killing an innocent animal. It's just like, no, you don't, you don't even get it. Yeah. That's a weird thing that people love to say. Mm -hmm. They love to say that, you know, you're killing an innocent animal. There's nothing yeah. innocent about being an animal, by the way. <laughs> you know, animals are living by the wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's what they're doing. They're, there's, there's nothing innocent about it. It's probably the least innocent thing that a living creature does. Yeah, if they have to kill to survive, any animal will. Yeah. I mean, that's... That's what it's about. Yeah, and they'll. By the way, they'll run you over with those fucking antlers. Oh yeah, they'll no. make a charge at you and run those fucking things through you like a shish kebab. Yeah, no, I know it's. So I just, you know, I just think. So that's that's kind of why I like videoing, the work and the effort and all that because, you don't necessarily have to do what I do, but just respect it, you know. And, the, that's a thing. I mean, that's I, I don't show all that for to try to to get respect but i just want you know I, people have an easier time with bow hunting for whatever reason because it seems like it's harder you know mm -hmm. then, then they'll they'll easily say negative stuff about rifle hunting because they say oh you don't have to be close or you can shoot from 400 yards or whatever yeah. but with bow hunting for whatever reason we get a little more of a pass because it is difficult so um and rifle hunting is hard too i'm not i don't want to say rifle hunting is easy because it's a whole different deal you're you're hunting in um there's more competition with the rifle out there, so you're competing against other guys. Uh, the animals have been hunted a little more, so they're a little more wary by that time of year. So rifle hunting is still tough, and and those guys have my respect as well. But just for the general population, it seems like bow hunting, and bow hunting is cool right now. Yeah, I mean it's gaining in popularity. It's just is it really? Yeah, it's just you know. How, how what, what do you attribute that to? I don't know. Cameron Haynes videos online. It's all all me. It's, I <laughs> I did it all. No, <laughs> I mean from uh, Hunger Games. You know, you know. Cat, is that what it is? Catness out there. Well, it's just kind of, it's just kind of cool. And then I get a lot of emails and correspondence from young guys who want to be more badass, so to speak. And 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 bow hunting. I mean, shooting a bow is just cool. Yeah. You know. Well, for folks who don't even want to shoot anything, they don't want to kill an animal, you might be a vegetarian, whatever, you, you might just be fine, John Hackleman style, going to the supermarket and buying your steak. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, but I really love archery, and I've rediscovered it. I did it when I was a kid. I was in the Boy Scouts, and I, I enjoyed it then, but I never really got into it. I just did it a few times, and I always thought it was fun. Mm -hmm. But man, um, since I picked up uh, the this uh, bow, uh, I guess I got it about a couple of months ago, um, 
I really enjoy it. I, I just enjoy shooting targets. It's yeah. really fun. Right. Because when you're concentrating on that target, you're not thinking of nothing else. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. You're trying to be steady. And when you're trying to be steady, there's something zen in that. Mm -hmm. And when in that zen activity, there's something that's it's cleansing or something. I, I mean, I don't... I don't know what it is, but in order to really be accurate with a bow, it requires so much d discipline. Yeah, it does. And that's, you know, getting out, shooting a bow. I like getting out in the summer, uh, <laughs> shirt off, listening to music, just by myself. I usually go by myself and just, you know, there's something about watching an arrow arc and drop into the target. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just... I don't know. It's powerful. It's uh, relaxing. It's zen-like, you know, like what you mentioned. And uh, I think people see that. And then you look at the bows, and the bows look cool. You know, everybody, they're, you know, you'll, you'll get into it also, but your arrow is like your signature. So everybody has their arrow, and it's got their colors. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's got, you can get custom wraps on it. So I have wraps that say, fear is a liar, and fletch that say, beast mode. And so your arrow becomes... You know, everybody, if you walk in someplace and you're shooting with other guys, everybody's looking at your arrow. It's just kind of cool. So you can customize people. They see their bows and they take a lot of pride in how their bow is set up. And everybody believes that their setup is better than the next guy's because for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, people get so invested in, in archery. It's just, I don't know, it's powerful. And, and like I've said before, bow hunting has changed my life. I mean, I went from from a kid who had no direction basically to now I know exactly what I want to do and who I want to be. And it's, you know, allowed me to get on, talk to Joe Rogan here in LA, bow hunting. Is that, <laughs> that's just, I mean, that just seems crazy to me. So it's, uh, it's, it's just a powerful deal. And, and you're wearing an Under Armour shirt, man. Under Armour sponsors you. I mean, you, they make your shirts. They do. I mean, just yeah. that alone. You're in an Under Armour commercial with a wolf. Yeah, no, Under Armour, they've been, um, my longest sponsor and i think i think they told me i'm their their longest tenured professional athlete really yeah nine that's years. incredible mm -hmm. how did you get involved with that um it was actually we were at shot show like so 10 years ago i think and i walked by their booth and they had uh there's a picture of Randy White. He was wearing under armor and they had it in their booth he's standing out there with a bow you know Randy White played for the Cowboys Super Bowl MVP and uh, he had his, this bow and I'm like, I mean, dang, he's looks like a monster. He's like 50 some years old and just veins everywhere. Just a stud. That caught my attention. I'm like, so I talked to um, Eric Crawford was the guy's name at the, at the booth there. And I'm like, so uh, how come you guys are here? You know, I thought you were sports, you know, just, you know, football and, and baseball, things like that. They go, Oh, we're getting into hunting. And all they had was like the, the green or the brown, just tight, stuff for hunting just that first layer and i said oh that's cool so it just kind of he had seen me i was editing this magazine called eastman's bow hunting journal and he had got the magazine so he knew who i was so it just kind of started from there i signed on with them and their hunting line now is huge yeah there's a commercial that uh i make fun of uh when, I, when it comes on because it's so silly there's uh, all these athletes like there's this woman who's like a professional skier, I guess. There's all these different athletes doing all this athletic stuff. And then there's a Duck Dynasty guy with his big fat moon pie <laughs> face. And he's, he's looking around. And they're talking about athletes. And he's blowing his duck call. I'm like, that's not an athlete. Dude, that's Willie. You can't. What's, who's Willie? The fat guy's Willie? Yeah. You, you can't make fun of him? I think that's like against some sort of law. Nope. I just did. <laughs> he's a fat fuck. And his, he's got a big fucking dinner plate face. He's big <laughs> boned. <laughs> he's fat. That dude's fat as fuck. That good dude couldn't go hunting with you. He's sitting around waiting for ducks to fall out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just hilarious that when his fat moon pie face comes on, no disrespect, that's when it says, <laughs> that's when it says athlete. It's like they say the word athletes, yeah. you know, that we make, you know, clothes for athletes. <laughs> like, come on, man. Uh, no, I don't. They didn't call me for that. They should know. call you for that is what I'm saying. <laughs> we you know, do you think America is ready? I mean, look, we have this duck dynasty show, right? So it's a reality show, which is. Let's be honest. It's not really a reality show. It's scripted. There's fake scenarios. It's but the premise of the show r involves hunting, mm -hmm. and I think that's fascinating. Um, I, I, I think I think the show is ridiculous, um, but I like the fact that it's a hugely popular show, and the show's about hunting. And 
I, I think there's a real hypocritical attitude that a lot of people in this country have because of the fact that food is so readily available, because it's so easy to just go to the supermarket and buy food. People say, well, why would you want to get it yourself? You must be a cruel person that wants to go out and shoot animals. Mm -hmm. I think even though it's a baby step, a show where like a Duck Dynasty type show where you see these guys that are hunters and it's a hugely popular show where 16 million people watch yeah. it, whatever the hell it is, that's good. Yeah. Because that's slowly starting to integrate. And it's okay because it's ducks and people don't really have some, as much of an affinity to ducks as they do to right. Bambi. You know, like a deer hunting show would be a little bit more problematic. But mm -hmm. they need to do a show with you, dude. This is what I'm getting at. A show with you Tell them. out there. In the, I'm telling them right now. They're oh, okay. listening. Trust me. There's a lot of Hollywood people listening to this show. The shows have been made because of people being on this show. That would be a, a – there's that fat moon pie face. Back that <laughs> shit up. Look at this. Come on, son. Look at that big fat face. You are not an athlete, man. You gotta look, I, at, Willie's look a stud. at that. He's not a stud. Look He's at that. Look at that. That's a fat man. It's not a stud. <laughs> you're a stud. That's a fat man. I know you're being nice, but you gotta cut that shit. I mean, he could be a stud. He's got the potential inside of him, but he's eating fucking Cheetos and yeah, so his, moon pies. His dad, his dad um on that show on Duck Dynasty, mm -hmm. he he was an athlete at, I think, Louisiana State or something like that. But his backup, he was a quarterback on the football team, Willie's dad, Phil, and his backup was Terry Bradshaw. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. But how come Phil's all angry at the gays? <laughs> I don't, he's got I real don't. problems with the gays. Yeah, he does. Well, there's all these gays. <laughs> See, right there. Gays. Right how there. How good was Phil Robertson in football? See, he was a stud. Yeah, at one point in time. Now he's a gay basher. <laughs> he's all angry about gays. You gotta let it go, Phil. They don't care about you. You shouldn't care about them. <laughs> so, But, you know, as far as uh, me being on the TV show, so... I, uh, what, nice, nice segue and change gears. I like how you did that. That's <laughs> professional. That's how a good man in the media would do it. No, uh, so that I have to turn in a contract today for a reality show. Do you here in LA? Yeah, really. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why you're here. Um, yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Well, talk to me about it afterwards. I'll make sure they won't fuck you over because <laughs> things get tricky in the world of reality TV. Yeah. Well, this is just for the pilot. Okay. So, Either way, the, if you sign on for the pilot, you sign on for the rest of your life. Uh -oh. I, I have a friend who they asked him to do a reality show. And fortunately for him, he uh, he has his own business and he's doing well. But it was his girlfriend's idea. She wanted to do this reality show. And he read the contract and he calls me up on the phone. He's like, listen to this shit. He's like, they own my likeness for a life. Yeah. Like they own him for like, like what they're realizing because of all, you know, like from Survivor to Fear Factor, all these shows on. Mm -hmm. Is that they've realized, like, Fear Factor, Michael Yo is probably the only person that I know of that became famous because of Fear Factor. And Michael Yo is a comic, and he's on E, really, really nice guy. Wait, but you're famous. Yeah, but I was famous already. Oh, okay. I wasn't really famous already, but I was on a sitcom. And I don't know who Michael Yo is, so. He's a very nice guy. He's a comic. But my point was that, like, um... I guess I, I certainly became more famous because of Fear Factor, but Fear Factor re really didn't make too many stars. But some of those shows made stars. Yeah. You know, some of these reality shows, whether it's The Bachelor or, you know, of course, like uh, the, uh, the singing shows like American Idol made a lot of stars. Mm -hmm. So they've realized that there's potential money to be made once you're from uh, you're on that show they make you a star and then you're a business you're a brand well they want that brand mm -hmm. so they they are some unscrupulous producers and networks they they have these all encompassing contracts that are insane like you you're on this show and then they fucking own you and they can use your likeness till the day you die mm -hmm. i mean they own you forever and it's 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 insane. And people are like, I'll take it. I want to be famous. <laughs> like they'll do whatever they can. And so like if you went and did something else, say if you did that and the reality show takes off and does well, but or or doesn't do well and then gets canceled and then you wind up doing something else and that becomes it, they still own you. Mm. They st the first guy still owns you. Oh, I got so the contract they, over there. You need to look at well, it. Well, you need to get a lawyer <laughs> to look at it. It's 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 a tricky business this yeah. world of reality TV and they look at people as commodities and they mm -hmm. look at reality as being flexible. So the their version of reality is not really reality. I mean they're calling it reality shows but a lot of what you're dealing with is these people that were involved in 
in fiction. They were involved in like sitcoms or mm-hmm. dramas or what have you, and they're producing reality TV now. So they engineer it. It's all fake. Mm-hmm. Like they have fake setups, fake scenarios. I had a problem with the show that I did for Sci-Fi, where an editor put a fake scene in. Mm. They put a totally. They took a video. They added sound to the video, and they said that a listener or a podcast listener had sent this video in. Total lie, complete fabrication. I found out about it, and I went fucking crazy. I had a shit fit. I couldn't believe they because especially my show was all about trying to find the truth. You know, it was about right. Joe Rogan questions everything except this fake fucking video, apparently. <laughs> But it's standard. That's yeah. what they've always done. Yeah. They, they've just been, they do it because they think it makes a better, they, they call it creative license. Right. They think it makes a better show. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make a better show. They don't have to do it. They just, they need to follow Cameron Haynes, the bow and arrow, hunting for elk. Yeah. What would we call it? I don't know. Don't, well, don't, let's do it off the air because someone will fucking steal our idea. <laughs> off the air, we'll come up with a way to do it with you. Okay. You got to be careful though, man. Don't get in bed with the wrong cats because, uh, this is, a, this is a sneaky town, you know, and they know, oh, look at this nice guy from Oregon. Yeah. He's, he's a sweetheart. Hillbilly. He probably tells the truth all the time. Poor yeah. bastard. <laughs> he's, probably, he's probably honest. We'll eat him alive. Yeah, out there hunting and everything. No, 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 go hunt. We got your contracts, whatever, whatever. Don't worry about all that. Yeah. We, we'll take care of you. We'll take care of you. I think that'd be a great show. I've, I've said that about Steve Rinella's show, too. Steve Rinella's show, in my opinion, is the best hunting show on television. Mm-hmm. Meat Eater's a great show. And it's a great show not just because it's a hunting show. Mm-hmm. It's a great, you know, quote-unquote reality show. But it is a real reality show. Like, right. he got charged by a grizzly last night, the episode mm-hmm. that I watched. Like, they were um, in the woods, and they were, uh, they were actually bear hunting. And a grizzly mother with her uh, her her cat no what, what do we call them cubs oh, cubs cubs charged her and uh, charged them and mm-hmm. it was fucking crazy you yeah. see, see this giant grizzly running through the bush at them it's like yeah. whoa yeah that's, that's intense and the narration you know steve is a really well-read guy he's very intelligent and articulate so it's fascinating mm-hmm. and he's an introspective guy too because the way the way he looks at these scenarios and life itself is really interesting and him you know just talking about grizzly bears and ca- talking about you know, the, the, the it, it becomes an interesting show outside of the fact that it's a hunting show. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know? Yeah, you could have a good show even, you know, where the kill is secondary. This is it right here. This is, back it up so you can see it before she runs at them, because it's, it's kind of fascinating. She, she was like circling around towards them and they started to get nervous. So were they, were they grizzly hunting? She oh, yeah. Yeah, but they didn't want the she female, obviously. We chamber around. Hey, mom. Hey, mom. Yeah, they're trying to spook hey, her. Callahan's shooting out in front of her. And she doesn't care at all. I mean, while these three cubs are behind her, like, what's going on? What's up, mom? What's going on? I will shoot. I will under the kill this side. And she spun. Yeah. Peels off, spins away, and Callahan says, I'll never forget, I want to get him a t shirt with him and his mustache. And this, uh, he says, Smell us now, lady. Smell us now, lady. That's the <laughs> sentence that comes to Callahan's mind <laughs> the minute a grizzly bear changes his mind, decides not to maul him. What he's referring to is, as she cuts, she gets like, in the, in the she wind. She gets like a downwind direction, you know. And so Ryan's saying, like, now the wind will carry my odor to realize that we're people and we shouldn't be messed with. And so what he yells is, smell us now, lady. Which came to kind of our, it's like the needy to rattling cry now. <laughs> Seems like she would have known from the rifles going off, too. But Well, yeah. Well, she heard it as she was running. She was probably breathing and yeah. growling and everything. Yeah. She probably didn't know exactly what it was until it was too late. Yeah. They get pretty tunnel vision about protecting. I think these shows... Uh, there's there's an element of reality in a, a good hunting show that would be fascinating on regular television. Mm-hmm. And these shows, a lot of them, they're on the Sportsman's Channel, the Outdoors Network, or uh, you know these these these. What, what what channel is your show on? Outdoor Channel. Yeah, Outdoor Channel. Yeah. And so these channels, like a lot of people, don't go to that area. Like for me, it's like six hundred, six oh five, six oh four, six oh six on Directv. And a lot of folks don't go to that area unless they're looking for Mexican porn. That's like a few channels. <laughs> That's six oh six, isn't it? <laughs> That's six eighteen or something. Well, there's uh, you know, some F- Fox Sports is uh, there's Fox Sports two or something like that. It's up there as well. Uh, one of those, you know, some some sports channels are up in that area mm-hmm. too. But you know, it's just a weird area of the dial. Yeah. And I think it's unfortunate. I think um, that's the untapped area 
I don't want to say this for Hollywood because these same fuckheads who make fake scenarios are going to come in and ruin it. But a show like Meat Eater or a show following you around elk hunting with a bow, there's so much dr- drama and reality in that mm-hmm. without having to add bullshit. Yeah. You know, and someone's got to do something like that. I mean, Meat Eater does, but someone else could do it too, where you make a pledge. Like, there's going to be no lying. There's yeah. going to be no fake shit. This is all real. Real. And it's great. Yeah. You real know? emotion, real, real providing. Yeah. And, you know, I've had that pitch to me recently about just showing, because just like the, the train, not only the training for the hunt, but the um, camaraderie, getting out there, like the challenges I do for my bow, giving back, yes. you know, just that is all part of the story. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're killing an animal at the end, hopefully, maybe not, you know, because a lot of hunts end with no kill, but just the, the whole journey, you know, and it seems like it would make good TV, but Steve shows a lot of hunts that have no kills. Um, I, I like that. I like that he keeps it real like that. I hate that expression though. Keep it real. Yeah, God, that expression is beaten up. <laughs> that is a beaten up in- expression. But the, the you know having that ethic because you know he had a mountain lion hunt. They, they didn't even see a mountain lion. Yeah, they, they went for nine days. Didn't mm-hmm. see one. He had uh, a recent elk hunt. Saw a bunch of elk. Never got close enough to get a shot at one. And, you know, I think that's important, man. I think it's it's important to show people that this is, it's, it's called hunting. It's not called shooting. Right. You know, it's, it's uh, here we're going to shoot animals today. Come on, watch us. Oh, people think that you drive out in a truck and drinking beer or whatever you do and just mm-hmm. see something and just shoot at it. Yeah. No, that's, <laughs> that's definitely not my hunting. Well, that is the problem that the, the public opinion uh, of hunting faces is the, the ignorance, you know. Well, Hollywood helps that too. Does it? Yeah, I mean, just you like know. the scene in Wolverine. Is that what you mean? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I mean, they're showing um, supposedly hunters out there. They shoot this. I think it's actually Wolverine, as he was a an animal, but shoot him with a poison pot arrow, which I don't even. I've never even seen a poison pot arrow, but so um, has poison on the arrow, shoots him. He turns back into Hugh Jackman or whatever, and then he goes and he wants what? to. He's a. Wait, are you serious? I think you <laughs> misread it. It was a bear. He oh, shot was it? A bear. He found the bear. Oh, he, was that he what had it was? Kill the, yeah, he didn't turn into a bear. No, well, You're I thought it was. the shit out of people, man. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> how high were you when you were watching this, man? No, I was on a plane actually, oh, okay. so I was probably okay. in and out of sleeping. Uh, but the but the point was is they got this this arrow out of the bear, I guess. And he went, he found the hunters. They were at the bar mm-hmm. and, uh, they're drinking at the bar and he went in there and, you know, shoved the, the poison arrow through the leader's hand. And it's just like, so it's just showing hunters as the bad people, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just like, that doesn't help anybody. First, yeah. who do- I've never been to a bar after hunting and definitely never used poison arrows. It's just like, is perpetuating that stereotype. Well, yeah, and not only that, the way you shoot it, the poison wouldn't even get to him. It'd blow right through him. <laughs> poison being the arrow on the other side of town. Yeah, right. No. <laughs> it's not even an effective way to transmit poison. You know, you got to get into the bloodstream. Yeah. You know, when you're shooting a missile through a, a bear's body, it doesn't work that way. No. Yeah, that is, you know, look, these are Hollywood stereotypes. These uh, classic black hat villains it's just so easy to do it's just lazy yeah Yeah, that's all it is but so i mean yeah i think people just have the have the wrong idea and so having a show that would show that you know success on elk with a bow is around 10 percent. so it's like 90 percent of the guys out there pursuing elk with the bone arrow are failing and uh, it's it's not guaranteed it is really tough showing that struggle and that's why i mean that's one of the reasons why i train the way i do i don't want to be in that 90 percent you know, my goal is to be successful every single year. So if you do what the average guy does, you're going to fail nine times out of 10. If you do more than the average, if you do more than anybody else or the, the standard, then maybe you'll have more success. And so as it is, I kill my bull every single year. And it's just, I think it's not because I'm any better. It's because I just work harder preparing. So, well, you've become better through hard work right you become better with knowledge you become better with training with fitness with preparation with arrow shooting you shoot arrows every day Mm -hmm. right yep yep so it's just you know and and that's but if people could see how difficult it really is and see that you know like we did film in australia where we have no food we have no water it's 120 degrees drinking piss drinking piss that (laughs) i think you know that would make 
compelling TV because they're like, wow, this is a lot different than I saw in the Wolverine movie, you know? <laughs> and I don't know. I think, I, I think it'd be not, I don't know. I think it'd be important to get out there yeah. because hunters are the number one conservationists there are in sharing that story. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, some people find that contradictory. It's like uh, I had a conversation with someone we were talking about uh, people. And I was saying, well, okay, if you, if you could only, you know, if you only hunted like one person a year, but the rest of the people, you, you made sure you fed them and you took care of them. They got great education and took care of their environment, made sure the streets are clean. Would it be okay to go out and hunt one person? Right. You know, people were like, fuck no. <laughs> and so, like, when you apply that to animal hunting, it's for a lot of people that's sort of the same sort of feeling they have. Yeah. But what they don't understand is as the apex predator. People don't like to think of as, us as the apex predator, especially if you're a vegetarian or if you're an animal rights lover. But there's a war going on between all life forms on this planet. Mm -hmm. We are just so far ahead of the other animals that we forgot it's a war. And we forgot that we have these POW camps in our cities. And we call them zoos. Mm -hmm. Okay, And that's what that is. Those are prisoner of war camps. That's what we dominate this planet. And the reason why you can get out of this office and go walk down the street and not worry about getting mauled is because we paved this motherfucker and we killed everything that can kill us and we made sure that anything that comes in, we call the cops and they send helicopters and they fucking circle the area with a flashlight until they find that cat and then they tranquilize it and they get it the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. we, we, this is our d domain. And you don't like to think it's our domain because you don't have to do any of the work. Right. But the reality comes into you full force. If you're alone in Idaho with a bow and arrow and you get circled by a bunch of howling beasts mm -hmm. and they're trying to take the elk away from you. Yeah. That comes, comes real clear then. Fuck yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. We are the apex predators. Whether you're a predator or not, the human animal is the apex predator. And as that... We have to be the stewards of the land. We have to manage this whole situation. And that includes managing predators. It includes managing game animals. It includes the whole kit and caboodle. And that's what hunters are. That's what hunters' dollars do, is they, they put that. Hunters are the, are the grassroots out there, feet on the ground, making it happen. And if you don't do that, you know what the other option is? You got to pay someone to go kill these animals, which is even more ridiculous. Because right. then you have to take taxpayer money away to go take animals that are made out of food, and you got to kill them. Mm -hmm. Like These are animals that people could have paid to go kill and then enjoyed the food themselves. Now you got to hire, like what they're doing in the Hamptons. Yeah. Have you heard about that in no. New York? Mm -mm. They have oh, deer? massive deer population. Yeah. So they're hiring snipers. They're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to do. They might spend money on, ready for this, strap in, birth control for deer. Oh, they're talking about spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to give deer food with birth control in it to keep them from Crazy. breeding. They're Crazy. made out of food. Yeah, there's plenty of people who would like to go and help them control those animals and pay to do it. Well, the problem is that it's an urban area. Right. And it's become they've, be, they've let it get so out of control mm -hmm. that the surrounding areas, you know, you, where you would have a safe area where you can hunt, especially bow hunt, you can't do it. So yeah. it's, it's so crazy. Like, they're going to have to hire snipers. They're going to they're gonna have to figure out a way to, to... I mean, you don't want hunters roaming around the Hamptons. Right. Especially, I mean, I wouldn't mind you doing it, but you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. the average Yahoo, yeah. the average dude, you know, you find out he can go hunting in the Hamptons and, you know... <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, I think you should have to have, like, a black belt in hunting to go ha hunting yeah. in the Hamptons. Yeah, but I hear you. Even then, I don't know if I'd be really cool with you hunting near a playground. No. You know? No. Your arrow misses the mark and goes flying into some kid on a Wait, slide. My arrow what? Not yours. Right, okay. You meaning so that speak. other guy out there that doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> I missed once. But it's, I bet you did. But it's, that's a, that's uh, the reality of the situation is that we're the ones as the intelligent creatures that can communicate. We're mm -hmm. the ones who have made an assessment. We've made a, a detailed analysis of all the different animals and the numbers and we monitor them on a yearly basis and mm -hmm. folks who don't know they don't appreciate that i wasn't a hunter when i was young and i didn't understand hunting and i thought there was something fucked up about it i, I would say why would anybody want to kill a deer man deer, deer are beautiful mm -hmm. i was a fisherman i used to go fishing yeah but that's where it ended for me because i can't relate to a fish fishing for me is like 
tricking aliens. Like they live in this water world that I can't even see in. I throw something in there, I pull it out, <laughs> yeah. and I eat it. Like I can't relate to them. Right. You know, they're running around breathing water. Like pfft, I can yeah. eat you. I got no. They don't even take care of their young. They are just like you're 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 on your own. Get the fuck out of here. Like yeah. I, it's it was a different thing for me. So I can relate to people that can't relate to hunters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That uh, and I don't know. I I think getting down there to the bow shop. And even just like you said, shooting a bow, you don't necessarily have to be a hunter. No. But if you can listen to a hunter and kind of listen to their stories and listen to it, you don't, I mean, you don't have to go kill, but a lot of guys learn a lot of good life lessons out in the mounds. And maybe you can pick up on that. I like hanging out at the, you know, the, the shop that set up your bow yesterday, uh, or not yesterday, the day before, I think was, is the bow rack in Springfield, Oregon. And that's like it's like a bar with no alcohol as far as listening to stories. It's awesome. Sure. I love sitting on the stool, picking things up from other guys and just hearing stories. And that's a, you know, you don't have to be a hunter to to enjoy that and enjoy firing a few arrows. It's uh it's soothing. Well, people that participate in the same sort of discipline, they 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 enjoy that camaraderie together. They understand each other in a way that maybe other folks don't. You get that from jiu-jitsu gym, you know, you get that from a kickboxing gym, you get that from a, you know, a CrossFit studio, you get that from anything that you do where the people can sort of relate to this unusual activity that you partake in. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that that's, that's something about archery. You know, when you go, like, when I, the, the place that I went to, the archery outpost in uh, Los Alamitos, there's a bunch of people around there talking about, the, oh, have you seen the new Hoyt? You know, yeah. they got a new cam on the Matthews, and this has got a, oh, they got a, the Bowtech and Sandy, 355 feet per second, and blah, blah, blah. You yeah. know, all that shop talk. And it's, a lot of people are missing that sort of camaraderie in their everyday life because yeah. most days from nine to five, you don't get to talk about what you want to talk about. You have to talk about what you're getting paid to talk about. You got to exactly. talk about what your job entails. And, mm-hmm. For most people, they're trapped, trapped in this this world. Like you know, unfortunately, you said you are. On some <laughs> Did ways. I, I didn't say that. Get this reality show, brother. Get cracking. <laughs> You'd be right up there with that fat moon pie face guy <laughs> on TV. Sounds good. No ducks though, just elk. Yeah. Bugling elk and arrows and bears and and all, everything. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mountains. Yeah, dude. Listen, man, this has been a really fun podcast. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for We got to do this me. again. Yeah, for definitely. sure. Thank and, you. And keep me posted on this uh, reality show and keep us posted. And if it actually does come off, we will promote the hell out of it, man. Promise. All right. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So if anybody wants to find Cameron online, it's uh, Cameron Haynes on Twitter, but he don't use that. So you got to find him on Facebook. He uses Facebook, but Facebook goes straight to Twitter. Yeah. It's one of those, you don't even know your, your Twitter uh, password, do you? It's somehow magic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somehow a magic connection. Yeah. I, had my, I had my buddy Colin set that up for me. Well, they'll probably give, they could probably reset it. I'm sure they could reset it for you. Yeah. But you should get on Twitter too, man. Twitter, Twitter is a, it's a great resource. I'm know? on Instagram also. Oh yeah, that's right. And great <laughs> photos on Instagram, by the way. You put a lot of cool Thanks. stuff on Instagram. Very inspirational. You're Thank an you. inspirational guy. Uh, I love your story. I love your, the, your ethic. I love what your, the, the philosophy that you take in this life. And I really, really truly believe um, what I said that what you do is inspirational and it, it, it creates action that inspiration is it, it makes people do things it gives them the energy and the enthusiasm to go out and accomplish things on their own and i think that's what life is all about really we're all in this together and i think that we all benefit from each other and we benefit from fine examples of other human beings and i think you're an excellent example oh, of a human you. being and it's an honor to meet you sir oh thanks for having me joe thanks and let us know and what when you're doing a show on on, on the outdoor channel and what is it well, I've been on Team Elk. Team you Elk? Know, that's, that's where I've been appearing. But we're, uh, you know, I've had a number of people approach me about doing my own show. And so just trying to get that hammered out. And in addition to these reality shows, I want some, the hardcore hunter character. That, um, so we'll see what happens. Probably nothing will happen. No, 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 no. Something will happen. Don't say nothing. If you want something to happen, it'll happen. Okay. We're going we're gonna to help you make it happen, man. For right. sure. Definitely. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back tomorrow with Aubrey Marcus. I uh, want to thank Stamps.com for, uh, for sponsoring this podcast. Go to Stamps.com and use the code JRE to get your $110 bonus offer. And thanks also to 1-800-Flowers.com. And check out their special limited time offer. 
for only $29.99, you get 18 beautiful red roses. And that is for a limited time only, ladies and gentlemen. That is only until Sunday, February 9th at midnight. That's 18 beautiful red roses for only $29.99. Thanks also to Onnit.com. That's O-N-N-I-T. Use the code word ROGAN and you will save 10% off any and all supplements. Tomorrow we will be with Aubrey Marcus, who is the CEO of Onnit.com and a real psychedelic adventurer. We will talk about life, spirituality, and he's a hunter himself. We're going to have a good time, folks. We've got a lot of cool shit going on. A lot of fun people next week, too. we got artists and comics and Joey Coco Diaz and War Machine is going to be here next week, a.k.a. John Copenhaver, and we're going to have a good time. We love the fuck out of you people, and we thank you very much for tuning in. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>